I don't know what has mocked God in your life, but in the name of Jesus, it ends now. 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 Them, I just sense that there is a shift in the atmosphere. The anointing that is shifting in the atmosphere is an anointing that is bringing stability back. There are people's lives that are it's, it's like a reed before the wind. Please hear me. Listen very carefully. We're about to pray. Please be sensitive now. Spiritual illumination backed up by a life of intense prayer and fellowship with the secret is the key to ever increasing grace the abundance of grace please bring the gentleman that shouts now under the anointing as i mentioned abundance of grace i just saw the word prophet and i saw light on someone a gentleman i don't know who that person is please when you find him bring him we're going to pray just a few minutes the key to church growth don't argue it results are exact in the spirit go and find out what has God placed upon his servant the secrets of men are contained in their words you know God by knowing his word so you know men by studying their words their speakings are a revelation of their mindset their understanding you may not have the liberty for close proximity but you can draw close to their minds using the vista of their words settle down find the area in your life that is not working and invest in light back it up with prayer the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 it says and they continued steadfastly in the Apostles doctrine and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayer Acts chapter 4 and verse 33 and now we we'll pray and I wrap up the Bible says and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection and great grace was upon how many that means all of us can carry great grace great power comes with great grace great grace comes with great knowledge great grace was upon them all listen the quality of your witness in this end time depends on the level of unction an enabling grace that you carry which is a product of the time you have invested in the study of the word high level spiritual illumination intense moments of prayer and fellowship with the spirit nothing else will replace these keys whether you want to be an extraordinary ceo an exceptional man of God you want to become an exceptional father mother leader the formula is the same you cannot ignore the word of God ignore the ministry of prayer and fellowship with the spirit one communication of the spirit in the place of fellowship can equal the next 20 years of relevance in your life listen we have gotten to times in the church age where 
depending on the intellect alone or over dependence I would say on the intellect will prove to be costly in the days that come because let me tell you the truth there are trajectories we are about to tour that no man can claim to have had the experience not within this dispensation you would have to be three four hundred years old to tell us I've seen this before everybody who saw that cyclical move has gone so we are infants relative to the moves coming you need to depend on the ancient of days there is a fountain of wisdom you must tap in the place of fellowship only God will tell you what the next 10 years of ministry will be Reverend Sam spoke about my teaching so graciously and I'm so grateful for that but let me tell you as at the time God instructed me to start putting teachings online internet was just in its infancy within the African soil and the Lord spoke to me we if I think Facebook just started or so and he told me he said put these teachings quality of production very poor was not I mean sometimes you would have to stretch to listen to some of the audios and he said put it online and my angel will take it to the ends of the earth have you had God for 2023 20, till 2033 has he spoken to you don't assume it to be business as usual COVID has taught us the, the, the excellency of staying with the spirit to navigate the ever-changing world that we live in Billionaires fell to nothing within one year because of over dependence on the flesh. Proverbs 3 5 to 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, it says, and lean not on your own understanding. The next verse says, In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. I love verse 7. It says, Be not wise in your own eyes. It says, Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. You can be wise in your eyes. Hallelujah. With great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection and great grace. You are lifted by grace when you are lifted through knowledge. You are lifted by grace when you are lifted through high level illumination. Listen, there is no amount of darkness you will confront in this life that does not have a light component to drive it away. John 1, 5, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Is someone ready to pray? I plead for a few minutes, just a few minutes, so that we can just cap this and, and, and take some moments to pray. Don't allow this year, not after this Gilgal experience, don't allow this year. Listen, let me tell you, regardless the prophetic word, every year remains like the previous year until you engage. Until you engage. Remember this word, exceeding precious promises. Commitments bound by conditions, bound to conditions. Cain and Abel went to offer sacrifices. One walked in keeping with the patterns. Abel, his sacrifice was accepted. Cain compromised on the pattern and his sacrifice was not accepted. He was angry and God said, why are you wrought? If you had done it, will you not be accepted? The same Lord is rich unto all. What has God done to the sister you said in your church here or another person and it looks like he's not done it to you? For others, it's a matter of time, like your pastor has said. Haven't done all to stand, you just stand and wait with patience until it comes. But for others, you are waiting in vain because you have not even done anything. Waiting for a harvest over a seed you have not sown is fraud. So you need to ask yourself, have I sown? Don't just say I'm expecting a harvest. The danger is that it's time that will reveal both, whether you have sown well or not. I made up my mind as a commitment. I started this from my time of retreat. I made up my mind that I would, be, I would press and stretch myself, not from a competitive standpoint, but that there are heights, virgin dimensions in the spirit we must press and we must touch. As I study God's generals and these people, my goodness, this is child's play relative to the levels of the grace that these people touched. Dimensions that makes you a blessing to nations.
I vowed a vow in the name of Jesus that I would never stand on any man's pulpit and preach rubbish and waste their time and they just clap and say show him the way up. no 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 there are souls to be saved there are lives to be transformed for some people that is the last sermon that sermon represents the last the last string of mercy they have for their deliverance my life must change my life must change because I've touched your grace I've touched your grace my life must change my life must change I've touched your grace I've touched your grace you will never be the same you've touched this grace your life must change you will never be the I'd like you to begin to thank God for this teaching tonight everywhere while you're standing I saw several people outside the overflows and those who are following from across the globe now is the point where you press come on this is a church of prayer this is a place of prayer is someone praying just a minute or two to press Mark 11 24 what things soever ye desire when ye pray when ye pray when ye pray man of God pray businessman pray captain of industry pray mother father pray it's a new season there is an abundance of grace that God is bringing to the body of Christ but the grace follows after abundance of knowledge high level spiritual illumination obtain grace to press for knowledge obtain grace to press for knowledge Someone is praying. Hallelujah. Now you're going to cry. Listen carefully. It says the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion is the word koinonia, the fellowship, the sharing together. You see, it's important for you to pray, obtain grace to stay with the word until light comes. Isaiah 61 and 2 amplified says, arise from the depression and the prostration that circumstances have kept you. Shine for your light is come. You don't arise and shine because you are tired of sitting. You arise and shine because your light is come, not because your light is around. It's been around since 2015 for someone, but it has not come to you. May this be the year that it comes. Are you ready to pray? I obtain grace. Someone pray. Open up your mouth and pray. Grace to contend for superior light. The Bible says that he made many lights, but there were two great lights. One to rule the day and the other to rule the night. And then he made the stars also. Go ahead and pray. The light that empowers me to rule the day, the light that empowers me to rule the night, I obtain, I obtain. By diligent study, I, Daniel, understood by books. I, Daniel, understood by books. Someone pray. I 
obtain grace to be a student of scripture. I obtain grace to be disciplined towards my press for light. Definite light. Marvelous light. Light that illuminates every darkness in my life. I obtain grace to invest in prayer. Someone is praying. I obtain grace to invest in prayer. But we will give ourselves continually. Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The nations are calling for the mantle God has put upon your life. Man of God, the nations are calling for the grace he has put upon you. Oh Esther, oh Ruth. Oh Deborah, oh Elijah, the nations are calling. Hallelujah. You are brooding over every darkness. You are causing light to shine from dark in my life. Upon your life, you are moving over every time. You are causing light to shine from God. Now, spare me a minute. I want you to pray. Every grace you have seen at work in the life of your man of God, I stand in faith with you. I want you to place a demand upon it right now. By reason of being grafted to this spiritual tribe and his wife, the grace, the years of sacrifice in the spirit. I'm releasing my faith with you. Pray. What have you seen work in his life? What have you seen God do in this church? Is someone praying? Don't let pride keep you in that position. What have you seen God do in his life? Father, you have lifted him. Let that grace come upon me. Are you praying? The Lord who took him from the city of Azare in Bauchi and lifted him to become a voice across the nations. Lord, you can lift me right where I am, from where thou art. He says, lift up your eyes. Someone is placing a demand. And all of you who are connected to his prayer platform, there is a chance to pray all across the globe, placing a demand upon the grace that God has put on his life. Father, I obtain the grace for vibrancy in prayer. I obtain the grace to understand the capacity to understand scripture. Grace for fellowship with the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, there is the abundance of grace that a man can have. I stretch my hands now. Something is going to fall right now, just in one minute. I come as one sent in the name of the Lord. I want you to receive this with all your heart. You will be surprised what will happen to you. In the name of Jesus, Father, you have sent me here not only to preach, but to impart. I stretch my hands right now. Let that fire, that grace. Oh, speak from your heavens and the earth will sing. Oh, speak from the heavens now he from the earth. Oh, speak from the heavens and the earth will hear my altar is calling you oh God my 
for visibility the grace that can cause a territory that hear ye him anointing in the name of Jesus I impart that grace upon you now receive that receive that grace receive that grace visibility in ministry visibility in your family from where you are rise and let the nation see Jesus from your life in the name of Jesus Christ Hear me every delay in your life whatever has tied you in the same position there are two systems of advantage that are given by God to men to redeem time number one is restoration number two is speed I call upon these twofold graces may they rest upon your life now receive restoration receive speed Receive restoration, receive speed, receive restoration, receive speed. Hallelujah. Your pastor is a blessed man. God has shown him mercy. I want to stand in faith with him and speak. Can I tell you the truth? Believe me when I tell you, if you are not empowered economically, you will never be able to be an effective witness. The name of Jesus is very heavy. It takes resources to lift it up. If you will lift it with integrity. Did you hear what I said? The name of Jesus is very heavy. It takes resources to lift it high enough for the nations to see. God who has helped this precious man and his wife. I'm standing in faith. Listen, if you believe in this prayer, I'm praying for you. Many of you have been in this city, a land of plenty, but the two lip gates has been closed over your hands. I pray for you by the grace that helps men even financially. Between now and the next three months, I stand by the grace and the oil of this call. I declare, may my God surprise you. May my God surprise you. May my God surprise you. Access to favor, uncommon kindness, uncommon access, uncommon acceptance. Hallelujah. Many of you hear me. You are in this church, but you are not genuinely connected to the anointing. Genuinely connected. Jesus said, all that you have given me, I have kept. We only keep what we are given that stays as though. He says, except the son of perdition. He had to explain why Judas. Let me tell you, spiritual fatherhood is a responsibility. You account for those God gave you. And there are many of you that are sincerely, genuinely not connected. You connect through honor. You connect through giving. You connect through your prayer. You connect by supporting what it is the dimension of God committed to the man that God has given you are we together I don't know what has mocked God in your life but in the name of Jesus it ends now it ends now it ends now it ends now therefore by the privilege of God's grace standing on all the graces that have ministered here and the graces that will be coming and then the grace upon this precious man and his wife in the name of Jesus Christ I move you move to the next level move to the next level spiritually move to the next level spiritually in the name of Jesus Christ you are here and you are saying apostle I've heard everything you have said but I confess before Jesus and before his people I cannot say for sure I have accessed even the saving grace you cannot get the enabling grace until you have received the saving grace the administration of the enabling grace is for those who are in Christ remember in our teaching of grace we said it is all spiritual blessings that are routed through the office of Christ now listen very carefully before Jesus returns there will be a harvest 
mighty evangelical voices across the globe have been prophesying this i have seen it many times in my visions even in recent times that there is a prophetic harvest a harvest like never before because this gospel of the kingdom must be preached as a witness to the ends of the earth and then the end will come so there is an abundant supply of grace and of the spirit enabling as many who have taken god seriously to be able to frontier the course of the kingdom across the nations please hear me there are people here who are saying apostle reverend sam i cannot truly say that i am saved and for others you are saying well i remember making this decision but truly i cannot say as at now that my relationship with jesus is intact you may be inside you may be outside the overflow or you may be across the globe i understand there are people watching from across the continents of the earth wherever you are watching by television perhaps even by a rebroadcast jesus christ is speaking to you right now this is my last function here i'm going to call on all of those who are making this decision right where you are if i plead that you just clear the way please for them i'm going to count one to five and i want you with boldness to come and stand before jesus here please just stand make sure they don't interrupt the man of god whether you are rededicating your life to jesus or making this i'm just looking for one sincere person who is saying there is no pretense i came to church you are inside those coming from outside if it's for salvation please let them come i'm counting one to five now run to jesus run to jesus there's nothing to be ashamed of run to jesus please don't kneel stand for the sake of space so that others can come god's people is this the best you can do as you celebrate them he has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son come come and gentlemen thank you very much for this bold decision and those who are connecting again by way of television the internet as i lead these precious ones to pray make sure you pray i believe an email or um, something will be projected from you from the screen and then you would see a link or an information to just let the church know that you made jesus lord of your life and then to connect you to the prayer platform for your spiritual nourishment hallelujah all of you who have come, I salute you for making this most noble decision. This is the noblest decision that any man can make on this side of God's kingdom. Hallelujah. No matter how bad things are, it doesn't matter what yesterday was, he's able to give you a new beginning. May I request that you lift your right hand high above your head as a sign of surrender to Jesus. Go ahead, high above your head. Please say this after me. Let it be from the depth of your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, tonight I have heard your word. I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for me. I believe you rose again for my justification. Right now, I make Jesus my savior, my Lord, and my king. I declare that the power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken over my life. From tonight and forever, I declare that I'm a child of God. I go forward ever and backward never. In Jesus' name. Keep your hands lifted. Father, thank you so much for this harvest. We receive them and we declare in the name of Jesus, based on the authority of Scripture, we declare your sins forgiven. 
we call you bona fide recipients of the life of God. From tonight, we declare that you walk in righteousness, even in the abundance of grace. I commend you to the word and to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. May you be grounded and established in righteousness. And I decree and declare that you go forward ever and backward never. In Jesus' matchless name, I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Ghana, give Jesus a big shout of praise. Jesus be all the glory. It's a joy to be here. And I'm very, very touched by our hunger. So many people outside. I'm seeing several people, you know, hungry and with their hearts open. I want you to please help me appreciate the bishop and his dear wife. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you sincerely. Appreciate this opportunity. And I must honor a very great man of God, great prophet of God, Pastor Emos Fenwa. Please let's give him a big, big God bless you. Hallelujah. I sincerely honor and appreciate all the men, women of God standing here and then every other person in ministry. May the Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Our time is fast spent. Let's see how far God will help us tonight. Can you lift your hands to heaven? And let's ask the Lord for an encounter. Go ahead and ask him to give you a definite, destiny-defining encounter. Someone pray. Outside, make sure you are praying. Lift your hands to heaven and ask the Lord to give you an encounter. The encounter that turns Saul to Paul. The encounter that turns Cephas to Peter. For in Jesus' matchless name we have prayed. For in Jesus' matchless name we have prayed. Father, we pray that you speak to our hearts. We pray that you will grant us understanding, even by your word. Bless our hearts, impart upon our lives, open up our minds and our spirits tonight. And Lord, I pray that everyone who is here represented and the many who are following online, let none of us return back disappointed. For in Jesus' matchless name we have prayed. God bless you. Please be seated. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Can you hear me? Am I loud enough? Hallelujah. Let me plead with my sound people to help me so that we are clear enough. We gather like this for many reasons, and I'll give you only three of them. Then we'll begin to teach. Every time God brings us together, we must understand that there is something at the back of his mind. God has an intent for every activity. Hallelujah. Um, he does not call the seed of Jacob, the Bible says, to seek him in vain. And I'll give you three of the many reasons or the many intents behind every prophetic gathering like this. Number one, every time God brings us together, it is an opportunity to have an upgrade in our spiritual understanding. Hallelujah. As you'll be learning tonight, it matters that you grow. It matters that you ascend by light. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 2 says, I went up by revelation. I went up by revelation. Takes more than desire to go up. And I went up. I ascended heights and realms by revelation. Hallelujah. So when God brings us together, it's an opportunity for transformation by the word of God. By the way, let me tell you that God's method has always been and still remains his word. 
His method to lift is his word. His method to bless is his word. His method to lift men, to open up doors, everything happens at the instance of his word. John chapter 1 and verse 3 says, And without him was not anything made that was made. And without him, outside of the participation of the word, was not anything made that was made. Hallelujah. So when we gather, number one, it is for transformation, access to higher levels of light. The Bible says that he made two great lights, one to rule the day and the other to rule the night. That means there is no dominion for you except at the instance of light. Hallelujah. Number two, the second reason why we're gathered in a meeting like this is to experience the power of God. Paul said, when I came to you, I did not come with the excellency of speech. He says that your faith will not rest upon the wisdom of men, but upon the power of God. It is important that the saints experience the power of God. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night in John chapter 3. When you read verse 2, he says, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher sent from God, he says, for no man can do these miracles except God be with him. Except God be with him. There are certain things that attest to the fact that God is in a place. One of them is the power of God at work producing miracles, signs, and wonders. In Acts chapter 8, when you begin to read from verse 5, the Bible says Philip went down to Samaria and he preached Christ unto them. The next verse, the Bible says the people gave heed with one accord to the things that he spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. They did not just hear a message, they heard and they saw. The Christian faith was designed to be heard, but then to be experienced. Are we together? Please let me have your attention. So number one, that we're here for an upgrade in our spiritual understanding. Number two, to encounter the power of God. And number three, every time God gathers us together, it's an opportunity to impart upon us the various dimensions of graces required for the next level of our prophetic work. Because you see, in this kingdom, we only ascend to the degree to which we are imparted. The kind and the quality of grace upon your life is what defines your spiritual possibilities. Hallelujah. Two believers born of the same uh, life of God, but their results can differ in this kingdom. The difference between the result of one believer versus another is not the love of God. For the Bible says the same Lord is rich unto all. Are we together? Yes. But it is the kind and the level of grace that is at work in their lives. Acts chapter 10 and 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. It's not just that he was anointed. The Bible tells us look at the extent to which God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. The Bible says he went about doing good, healing all. They that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. In Acts chapter 2, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 4, they were filled with the Holy Ghost again. When they were threatened, he said, Now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto your servants that with boldness they will declare, you know, and the signs and wonders will be wrought through the name of your Holy Son. They prayed and the room shook and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says they went and they preached with boldness. There are many reasons, but these are the three. I want this to be at the back of your mind so that you're not just listening to a man of God or men of God and then you share the grace and go back. I recap one last time. That every time we gather, it is because there is a need for upgrade. Are we together now? Your spiritual understanding needs to be upgraded. Colossians chapter 1. Paul was praying over the church in Colossae and he made a desperate cry, a desperate plea unto God Colossians 1 and verse 9 he says I pray give it to us please media for this cause also since the day we heard it he says do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding hallelujah 
the light of God is very, very important. So, an upgrade in your spiritual understanding, an opportunity to experience the miracle working power of God. Hallelujah. Because you see, if God is Father, according to Scripture, the zenith of fatherhood, the real proof of fatherhood is not having children. The real proof of fatherhood is the extent to which you give. If ye being evil, he says, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? That means as wicked as you people are, I was speaking to them now, you still have a sense of compassion because you are fathers. How much more your heavenly father that you would give that which we are. So if it is true that God is father, there must be a platform for him to reach out to people, bring in healings, bring in deliverances. Hallelujah. And then of course, finally, to be imparted. It's very important. When God sends a word to Jacob, he intends that that word be lighted upon Israel. Nothing God gives a man should remain with that man forever. It is supposed to be a distribution point to as many who are hungry, desirous, and discerning. Has someone learned something already? So I'm teaching tonight, let's begin our session, Empowered by Light. Empowered by Light. Empowered by Light. First Timothy chapter 2, I begin my reading from verse 1 to 4. I hope you love scripture. 1 Timothy 2, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. We're reading to 4, verse 2. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Verse 3. It says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Let's read verse 4 together. Ready? One to read. Who will have all men to be saved uh -huh, and to come on to the knowledge of the truth. Apostle Paul is teaching his son in the gospel, Timothy, and he's expressing God's ultimate desire that this God desires that all men be saved and then not just to be saved, but to come on to the knowledge of the truth. Hallelujah. Are we together now? Yes. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 5, the Bible begins to talk to us about light. The first mention of light in scripture is Genesis 1 and verse 3. And Elohim said, let there be light or light be. And the Bible says there was light. Now verse 5, the Bible says, and God called the light day. Very profound scripture. He gave the light a name and he called it day and the darkness he called night. That means in the mind of God and in the economy of the spirit, day is not just when it is 6 a.m. in the morning till 6 p.m. Day only happens when you have light. Listen, 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 listen. Don't be too quick to just shout for nothing. Pay attention and understand listen are we together i know you are celebrating the word but do it with understanding the bible says he called the light day that means i can be chronologically speaking standing at a time that is 12 noon in the afternoon but spiritually i am still in the night because in the realm of the spirit, it is not the chronological passage of time that alternates day or night. As we know and have it in geography. Are we together? This in many parts of Africa now is night. So once it's 6 p.m., 7 p.m., thereabout, the sun departs and you have darkness. That is our concept of day and night. So day for us starts, say, from 6 a.m. in the morning down till about 6 p.m., but God is correcting that understanding. Geographically, you are right. But from the standpoint of spiritual intelligence, that you are only in your day when you access light. That means a man can be awake 10 p.m. and in the spirit it is day because you are standing from the abundance of light. Are we together? That God called the light day and the darkness he called night. John chapter 1 and verse 5. John 1, 5. 
John the Apostle, this is his own version of the gospel, his synoptic account. And he says in verse 5, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That means everybody who sustains light automatically has dominion over darkness. Hallelujah. I would always want to give this example. Imagine with me. Let me walk with your mind for a minute. Imagine a room that has been dark for 10 years. No bulb. No one has switched the light. 10 years. You have that in your mind? Imagine another room that has been dark for one year. No one has tried to put on the light. Imagine a room that has been dark for one week. Imagine the fourth room that has been dark for a whole day. And then imagine the fifth and final room that has been dark for a few hours. Question. The moment you put on the light for all the rooms, which of the rooms will be lightened first? That means the longevity of darkness does not count in the presence of light. The room that has been dark for years, months, weeks, days, hours, perhaps minutes, will respond the same way at the instance of genuine light. <laughs> Hallelujah. The meaning of that is that longevity of darkness is only as powerful as the absence of light in fact science has not truly been able to define light but scripture gave us a very profound definition of light it says that which makes manifest is light whatever makes manifest is light the assignment of light is to take away haziness and confusion to bring to bear that you are able to see things the way they are hallelujah I hope you know that the reason why you are able to see is not because you have two pairs of eyes. If I switch the light here, your eyes are still fine, but you will not see. It is the union of your eyes plus light that equals to sight. Hallelujah. So it is not just that you have a pair of eyes. It takes light in partnership with your eyes for you to see. We are discussing the subject of light, empowered by light. Light in scripture symbolizes three things. Please write. Every time you see light in scripture, it symbolizes, number one, knowledge. 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 Every time the Bible talks about light, it talks about knowledge. Number two, light in scripture symbolizes manifestation. Manifestation. Number three, light in scripture is always related to glory every time you see light you cannot define glory in its entirety and not add the light factor because the bible says even among the stars paul speaking to the church in corinth he says one differed from another in glory hallelujah one of the ways from an earthly standpoint when jewelries are, have, have been smelted and they've been worked on properly they glitter am i right on that yes they glitter as proof of their quality and as proof of their worth so light in scripture is connected to these three things one knowledge two manifestations three glory but for the purpose of our discussion the emphasis tonight is on knowledge spiritual illumination hallelujah are we learning now the way god designed the kingdom please look up the way god designed the kingdom is that after you encounter christ the moment you encounter jesus christ in what you know to be the new birth experience and i hope you know that the believer's journey begins the necessary and sufficient condition for you to be a recipient of god's life is that you believe in the substitutionary sacrifice of jesus Believing Jesus as a prophet does not save, even though that is true. Believing Jesus as God does not save, even though that is true. There is an exact information about Jesus you must believe to be saved. Demons believe Jesus, but they are not saved. Are we together? So just believing Jesus does not save. There is an exact information. You find that in Romans chapter 10 from verse 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with your heart the Lord Jesus, your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 10 now says, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 
So we only call someone a Christian, a child of God, if you have encountered this initial experience. It's important I don't just brush over this as we seek to discuss the subject of knowledge because spiritual illumination in the kingdom is for those who are in the kingdom in the first place. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, Rabbi, we know that thou art a man sent a teacher come from God, for no man can do these things except God be with him. Then Jesus replies in verse 3 and says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom. Nicodemus is amazed. How can a man be born the second time? Will he enter into his mother's womb? And then verse 5, he says, Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Then when we get to verse 16 of the same John, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his then only begotten son, that whosoever, that blessing is for whosoever, believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then verse 17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So it is very, very clear from scripture that the only way to be saved, there are not two, three, four, many methods. There is only one way. Jesus said very clearly, I am the way, not we are. I am the way. No pastor is the way. No church is the way. We only help to guide men to the way. I am the way. I am the truth, reality, and then I am life. Do we have that down? See, this is a prophetic conference, and it's important that our spiritual understanding be stabilized by methodically helping us understand. As simple as this thing I've said is, you will be surprised how many believers, respectfully speaking, even preachers, cannot articulate the elementary rudiments of the faith. If you cannot, listen, if you cannot articulate this, you are not growing properly. Are we together now? Yeah. When you send a child to nursery school, they don't begin to teach the child physics. Although one day he will learn physics. Imagine how wicked you will perceive a teacher to be finding him teaching students in a nursery school further maths and physics and chemistry and helping them to, you know, titrate and do all kinds of things. Would you keep your child in that class? But you intend, the little boy can say, I will be an engineer and I will be a doctor. You agree with him, but you verify that he grows methodically. So he starts by learning the rudiments. A is for apple, you say. B is for ball. And when he recites it to you, you are, listen, the goal is not to keep him limited like that. But that is the bedrock. That is the building block. So there are more, many believers who cannot defend the faith with understanding because our knowledge is random. We stumbled across anything spiritual and we just added it. And it, nobody, an architect builds a house with intelligence. You don't start your building with a zinc or a roof, although a roof is needed. Are we together? So the Bible says line upon line precept upon precept here a little there a little if you do not understand the rudiments of the new birth of salvation it does not matter how deep you are you are only being thrown up to come down because christ is that foundation are we together so when the believer by acknowledging the lordship of christ now comes into the kingdom listen carefully the bible now tells us that the holy spirit one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to now guide you. Even though he plays that role at the initial point of salvation, he now begins to guide you. Jesus said, I have many things to tell you, but ye cannot bear them now. John 16. He says, how be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Is that in your Bible? He will guide you into all truth. Hallelujah. So he now, the Holy Spirit, in partnership with the Word and in partnership with the teaching priest. This is why you must thank God that you have a man of God who allows you to grow methodically and holistically. The unbecoming of many believers is that sadly for many of them did not have the opportunity 
to be properly mentored under the ministry of a teaching priest jeremiah 3 15 and i will give you pastors or shepherds according to my heart and they shall feed you with knowledge and understanding they will feed you light is a meal you can feed someone with it and that person the same way you feed someone with proteins carbohydrates and you call it balanced diet the believer needs to be fed with light and that is the assignment of the teaching priest so the teaching priest in partnership with scripture and that from a child thou hast known the holy scripture are we together which is able to make you wise unto salvation and now brethren acts chapter 20 32 i commend you to god and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified so when you get saved the next step is the holy spirit in partnership with scripture the written word in partnership with the teaching priest takes it over from there and now you begin to learn the basic truths of the kingdom and there are seven found six foundational doctrines that if you are not taught your life is at a risk you find that in hebrews chapter 6 the bible calls them the foundational doctrines there are six of them we're not dealing with them this is just an introduction so that we will have an understanding listen you don't just stand and tell demons go and they go they verify your growth they verify what you are standing upon is the reason why many believers mock themselves we desire power we desire anointing we fall down and stand up but there is no stamina no strength no longevity of impact there is not much that can be done in and through our lives the reason is because there is bankruptcy of methodical growth Are we together? Please make sure you listen. Thank you. So the teaching priest in partnership with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God now begins to guide that believer line upon line, precept upon precept, series after series, teachings after teachings. And before you know it, you get to a point where a miracle begins to happen to your spiritual understanding. Your understanding is altered. You now begin to understand the ways of the kingdom. And with understanding comes transformation. That is the basis for Bible faith. When you are now sufficiently transformed, you now make way for empowerment. Empowerment is useless without transformation. To attempt to empower an individual in terms of impartation without transformation is the same thing as carrying oil or water and pouring it in a basket there is no sense of retainership it will not stay are we together look at the ratio look at how jesus built the early disciples who would later become apostles the ratio of teaching to impartation was three and a half years to one day they desired power and he told them sit down and learn sit down master let's do this why couldn't we pr sit down when he was done they were itching to go he said no 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 now you have knowledge but knowledge alone is not important it's not the the ultimate tarry ye now you have knowledge i've spent three and a half years teaching you when the holy ghost came nothing could stop them look at peter's sermon peter did not just say i was anointed no that's a good student when they all gathered he said no 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 no. we are not drunk as you suppose this is only the early hour of the morning but this is that and he began his discourse from joel to david at the end of it he said let it be known to you O israel that this same jesus whom you have crucified has now been exalted as lord and christ as a result the bible says they were caught to the heart and they said men and brethren what should we do he said repent for the remission of your sins and then you will receive this promise for the promise is unto you these were anointed men but they were doctrinally sound the early church the pattern for the building of the early church is found in acts chapter 2 and verse 42 the bible says and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers 
Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. When there was trouble as far as serving tables, they wanted the apostles to leave the apostolic duty and come and manage welfare issues. They said, no, get men among yourselves, seven of them, full of wisdom and the Holy Ghost. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. I sense in my spirit that one of the things that God is doing is helping someone to see the value of light before anointing. We are a generation that really loves anointing and that is important. You will receive the anointing. But the beauty of empowerment, you see, the oil will always assume the shape of the vessel carrying it. That was the problem with the woman, the wife of the sons of the prophet. Her vessel was small. It was not the oil. The prophet said no. Go and borrow vessels, not a few. And the oil started expanding to assume the size of the vessel. And when there was no more vessel, the oil stopped. Mm. Hallelujah. In Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, the prophet speaking by the spirit was communicating a lamentation from the spirit and he said my people this is a very profound scripture first two words my people even though they are my people he says they are destroyed not because of the strength of satan not because of the economy not because of the wickedness of the antichrist system they are destroyed he says for lack of knowledge lack of knowledge because thou has rejected knowledge you only reject what is available you only reject what was offered you we reject knowledge through pride we reject knowledge through an arrival mentality are we together no wonder the bible says we should receive with meekness the engrafted word because thou has rejected knowledge i will also reject thee that thou be no priest unto me the bible says in psalm 82 when you read from verse 5 to 7 it says they know not neither will they understand they walk on in darkness and all the foundations of the earth are out of course verse 6 and jesus quoted this same scripture in the new testament i have said ye are gods and all of you are children of the most high verse 7 says but you shall die like mere men and fall like one of these princes listen to me ladies and gentlemen in the kingdom our possibilities are defined first by the extent of light the spiritual illumination that we have submitted ourselves to from age 12 Jesus was not looking for impartation. He was in search of light. He was found at the temple discussing with the doctors of the law. Remember, this is the word incarnate. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. But when he was incarnated and he became flesh, he went to learn. Where do you think he learned it is written from? Matthew chapter 4. When Satan came to Jim, he did not say, I am God. He did not say, don't play with me. He didn't speak all kinds of cultural sentiments. He said, it is written. And Satan said, when it has to do with this, me to have studied, it is written. And all their discussions where it is written. It is dangerous to not know what is written. Because what is written is greater than what you saw. What is written is greater than what you heard. Listen, it is written can change what you saw. It is written can change what you heard. But thou, O oh Lord, art a shield for me. My glory, you lift my head. But thou, O oh Lord, art a shield for me. My glory, the lifter up of my head. Listen, any believer that is not full of light is like a man who even though an adult is moving with no eyes. Would you want to follow such a person? Would you trust such a person? And yet there are many sincere believers, respectfully speaking, some of them preachers. The blind leading the blind. Longevity in the house of God does not translate automatically to dominion. Dominion is the resultant effect of your accessing light. And when it has to do with the business of light, there is false light. The Bible says that was the true light that lighted every man. That means there are false lights. They carry a semblance of power and liberty. 
puffed up with knowledge, rema, but in the presence of real life situation, they do not sustain the potency that light brings. I'm challenging you first and foremost to know that the missing link, the journey between this version of you, where you are spiritually, and the prophetic version you have seen in your dreams and your visions is first and foremost light. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1 says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come. Profound scripture. Arise from the depression and the prostration that circumstances have kept you. Amplified says, rise to a new light. You don't arise just because you are, you've been there for a long time. No. The man who in John 5 was at Bethesda, he was there for 38 years until the light of the world came to him. You would think longevity of his stay would automatically translate to his miracle. But he remained there in pain and shame, close to breakthrough, but nothing happened until Jesus showed up. Many believers today are victims of demons curses yokes elemental limitations many believers today desire to rise to the full prophetic destiny some of you right from infancy there have been prophecies over your life like jeremiah in chapter 1 from verse 5 to 12 the young boy he says whilst thou were in your mother's womb before thou camest forth i called you and ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations but from that time till now most of us have not done much for the kingdom the reason is because we continue to recycle our limited respectfully speaking spiritual understanding and the only thing growing in our life is just our age we are not growing in knowledge we are not being relevant in the kingdom this conference was designed to shake you up and challenge you are we together and you see when ignorance unites with pride it finally chains you at the same level. Let me take it again. When ignorance unites with pride, our world is full of people with so little spiritual understanding. And yet their pride is as tall as the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. We must be ready to learn. We must be ready to sit down. Do not be embarrassed when it has to do with being in the school of the spirit. Don't say I've been in ministry for 10 years. Prove it by your result. The dexterity, the outworkings of the spirit, the construct of your spiritual understanding. Perhaps you are a pastor here and now as you are listening to me, the Holy Ghost through my words is telling you, this is what you need to teach your congregation. How would you raise a weak people teaching them like this? How would you guide if you teach people the rudiments of salvation and then you begin to ascend from faith to prayer to fasting? Then you now get to other matters. Oh, come on. You will raise men in the similitude of David. Mighty men. I submit to you that the reason why we largely have a weak church and a weak congregation is because we have a weak pulpit. Now, I'm, I'm saying this not, not from a standpoint of sarcasm and condemnation. There is too much excitement and ignorance and guessing and shadow boxing. No. God's people must be guided intelligently and methodically that one year in church should show in your life. How many of you will keep paying the school fees of a child who after one year he returns back cannot spell, cannot speak, does not understand and then they give you a PTA letter that the school fees has been doubled because of the economy wouldn't you want to see the principal you want to have a discussion with the man am I right on that <laughs> someone say light one more time say light so the Bible says that my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. There are two reasons in scripture why Jesus cried. Theologically speaking, 
the Bible records that Jesus cried twice in his earth walk. Number one, he cried in John 11:35. The Bible says Jesus wept. He cried at the grave of Lazarus. Am I right on that? And the people said, oh, how he loved him. Jesus wept. The second instance where he cried, I think that was Luke, Luke chapter 19, 41, 42. The Bible says he looked over Jerusalem and he saw the ignorance of the people and he cried, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if only you had known in this thy day the things that pertain unto your peace, but now they are hid from you. He was crying because he saw the ignorance of the people. Ignorance made the son of the living God cry. Hallelujah. The Bible is full of many instances where believers are mandated to contend for knowledge. For instance, Ephesians chapter 6, Paul was mentoring the church in Ephesus. Ephesians 1, my apologies. When you begin to read from verse 16, here's what he said. Ephesians 1, 16. I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Are we still together? Verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of your calling, what is the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints. 19 says, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power so paul was praying for believers men and women already saved but he was praying that the eyes of their understanding be enlightened that they may know ephesians chapter 4 and verse 18 same paul same ephesian church having their understanding darkened he says being alienated from the life of god through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart and now there are people in the body of christ who are not totally in ignorance in fact i really really believe that any believer that is serious and has been under a teaching priest should have had some level of knowledge the challenge is that the light from your phone cannot light this entire auditorium although it is light the darkness in the world, the darkness that wants to bedevil your destiny does not require a little light. You need high level illumination. 1 Corinthians 8, 2. So there are people who have light. We know a few things here and there. But the Bible leaves us a strong word of caution. 1 Corinthians 8, 2. Let's read together. Ready? One to read. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he says he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. You may have listened to my teachings where I give examples that in our grading system, I believe it's same with Ghana, we have F being the least grade, am I right? And A being the highest grade. Now, F does not mean zero. F means from zero to 39. So anything you score within that range is still considered F. So in a class of 10 students where the highest scores 38%, when you say who is the best, they will bring the one with 38%. But from a great system of F to A, who passed? <laughs> Hallelujah. So before we begin to be puffed up with pride and say i'm the highest among my contemporaries we will need to take scripture and grade you 38 may be the highest of the 10 but what grade is that over 100 and yet you can have a class of 50 students and the least student is 72 and when you say who is the least performing student he will come up but from that grade system he had a b The assignment of every man of God is to so file and build believers to a point that the least among us is as great as David. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do you believe this? In Psalm 45 and verse 4, Psalm 45 and verse 4, the Bible says, Ride in thy majesty, ride prosperously because of truth. 
your excelling, your dominion, your joy. Prosperity here has nothing to do with money. It just means to excel, to surpass ordinary standards, to ride prosperously like the king that you are because of truth. Hallelujah. Your health, your longevity, your finances, your growth in life and ministry, your excelling, your dominion over the cosmos are all light dependent. That means if you ignore light, you have made a bad bargain with your destiny. If you ignore light as a preacher, you ignore light as a businessman, are we together? Yeah. The Bible says the same came to his own, talking about the light, and some of them received him not, but to as many as received him. That means there are people who will reject light. And God will respect your choice, except that you will peg and limit yourself in life and destiny. Very quickly for the purpose of our discussion tonight, light I taught you translates to knowledge. So every time I talk about light within the context of this discussion, let your mind think knowledge. There are five dimensions of knowledge that every believer must know. In fact, there are six. I'll start wherever we stop, just a few minutes, and then we'll end for tonight. Commit yourself, by the way, let me encourage you to not miss the remaining sessions. No matter what sacrifice, what price you will pay under God and as much as is within your power, please pay that price so that you will capture everything that God has in store for you. If we're together, shout a loud amen. amen. So there are five dimensions of knowledge. Not every knowledge is useful for the believer, but there is an exact body of truth that is important if the believer must rise. Are you ready for it? Five dimensions of knowledge that you must contend for. Number one, the first dimension of light you must crave for, you must contend for, is that you must know God and his son, Jesus Christ. That is the first dimension of light you must seek to know. You must know God and you must know his son, Jesus Christ. John 17, 3. This is life eternal, that they may know thee, John 17, 3. This is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus whom thou hast sent. Daniel eleven thirty two, 32, the B part. But the people that do know their God, is that in your Bible? They shall be strong, capacity, and they shall do exploits. The people that do know their God. The people that do know their God. The first dimension of light, knowledge you must pursue is the knowledge of God and to know Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, your confidence in this kingdom is based on your encounter with God. If you have not met the God of the Bible in the burning bush, you cannot stand before Pharaoh. Pharaoh will ask you who sent you. And there are many of us who have been asked by the pharaohs of life. Who sent you? You want to be the one to rise up and end tears and end curses in your family? It's not just because you are a church goer. These principalities and elemental spirits have been there before you were born. They will ask you who sent you. Moses said, do not send me until you reveal yourself to me. And God said, I am that I am. When he stood before Pharaoh, he was not threatened by the pride of Pharaoh, nor the dexterity, the extent of the wizardry of Egypt. Many, many believers talk about God, but they do not know God. Reminds me of an experience in the early church where a few people came and they built a monument to an unknown God. They were worshipping a God they did not know. They were giving to a God they did not know. They were singing to a God that they did not know. It is time for you and I, ladies and gentlemen, to press for a higher and a deeper knowledge of God and a deeper knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you care, please make reference to my teaching, Knowing God. I have done a teaching there where I show you the four pathways to knowing God. There are four biblical pathways to knowing God. Number one is through scripture. Number two is by studying his names. Number three is by the man Jesus, the embodiment. 
The Bible says in Ephesians, uh, Hebrews chapter 1 from verse 1 and 3, God who in sundry times and diverse manners spake to us in time past by the prophets had in this last day spoken to us through his son in whom he has uh, had appointed to be heir of all things. And so he begins to speak like that. And then number four, experience. So we can know God. The point is, the first dimension of knowledge you must press for is the knowledge of God. Please write it down. This is eternal life that they may know thee, the one, the only true God. There are many things that call themselves God. There are many spirits that call themselves God. And so that you are not confused, you must know the one true God. And it's important to know it before your journey to exploit. Because you have no idea the challenges. What fought your father, your grandfather, the territorial spirits that are across regions. It takes the knowledge of God to stand tall and say like the apostle would say, I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which is committed unto him against that day. Are we still together? Number two, very quickly. The second dimension of light, knowledge. Those outside, are we following? Shout a loud hallelujah. Thank you. I need to know that you're with me. Number two. The second dimension of light and knowledge that every believer who desires to be empowered, you desire to be mightily used by God to do much for the kingdom. The second dimension of light that you need to have is that you must know yourself, who you are in light of who Christ is. As simple as this revelation is, if you do not know who you are, in light of who Christ is, you will live a defeated life already. You must know who God is and his son Jesus Christ. Number two, you must know who you are in Christ. Very powerful, very profound statement. Let me give you two scriptures. Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 1 to 6. I like Paul. I've met him once in my vision, but I pray that when we get to heaven, I have the opportunity to discuss and I say, you this man, very interesting man. Thank you for mentoring us. Paul was such a powerful man. I hope you know he brought a dimension to the kingdom that is not found in the gospels. Jesus said, I have many things to tell you, but he cannot bear them now. Those many things were the things Paul revealed. Without the epistles, you cannot understand the implication and the advantage of the gospel. Jesus never taught the advantage. No. It was Paul who helped us to understand. And that you find in Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 2. It was Paul who let us know that we've been seated with Christ. It was Paul who let us know the extent of our dominion. Far above principalities, powers, thrones. Is that true? It was Paul who arranged the organogram of the satanic kingdom. It was Paul who arranged the gift of the Spirit and taught us how to administer it that all things be done decently and in order. So, Ephesians 2, 1. And you, now, Paul by the Spirit is teaching us about us. It's not enough to know about God. You must know about you in light of who God is. And you, hath he quickened who were dead in your trespasses, and sins wherein in time past you walk according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now walketh in the sons of disobedience three the bible says among whom ye had your conversations in time past and so on and so forth verse four but god hallelujah who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us five reading to six even when we were dead in sins had quickened us together with christ and by grace are ye saved and had raised us together and made us to sit together shout this word together yeah. one more time say together yeah. as simple as this word is it can redefine your spiritual reality together with christ preaching together healing together doing business together you can fail alone, but you and God cannot fail together. Listen. Without God, I'm a failure already. You can fail alone, but not when he walks together with you. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Are we together? Had raised us up. 
Now, you can know yourself in the flesh. I am from Takoradi or I am from somewhere in Ghana. That is just, that is just, that is, that is anthropology. You see. But I am talking about knowing yourself by the spirit. That I have been called out of every tribe and every tongue and every nation. That I may be weak in the flesh but I have been exalted. Elevated to a position where I am seated with Christ. That is a reality that does not depend on designers. That is a reality that does not depend on, on the physical things, all the paraphernalia that we have around that try to make us feel valuable, as important as it is. It's a living spiritual fact that when you are in Christ, the Bible says, number one, that a real translation happened from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. And it is up to you to know it and to believe. You need to know who you are in light of who Christ is. This is not just Pentecostal gibberish. Your confidence does not just depend on the knowledge of God, but the knowledge of yourself. Hallelujah. When you know who you are in Christ, there are things that will not scare you again. No. My friend, please stand. If I call you a baby, will you cry? Will you pray about it? What will you do? You will feel sorry for me and hopefully be sure that I'm fine. Because of, listen, you are so confident in your adulthood that my statement has no effect on you. The revelation that you are an adult has immuned you. Now, many believers chicken over everything. Someone will call you this today, call you that tomorrow, simply because you are not standing strong upon that which the bible declares it says let god be true and all men liars when jesus came he was not in confusion about who he was there were things he told them he acknowledged he was the messiah he even said before your abraham your father abraham was i am he was not apologetic for that statement he was not pride he was the truth ladies and gentlemen please sit down thank you if you know who you are, you will know who you are not. Hallelujah. Yes. So you must take the time to learn who you are in light of who Christ is. Because our identity in the kingdom is derived from who Christ is. The Bible calls him the firstborn among we the begotten. That means we don't know who we are until he defines our identity because we are created in his image and in his likeness are we together according to ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 the bible says for we are his workmanship is that in your bible recreated in christ jesus unto good works so we were redesigned regined in christ we will have to look at the original to know who we are Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. So Satan does not just know God. He knows men. Jesus, I know. The Savior of the world. Paul, I know. But we have checked in the spirit. I don't know you. You are moving around, preaching around, but you are not known. And yet they were saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Blessed wonderfully and fearfully made the beloved of God the head and not the tail this is what he calls me you refuse to allow Satan call you any other thing situations and circumstances can call you all kinds of name you are ugly you come from a family that is the least that is the devil's business with his ignorance as far as you are concerned and as far as you're being recreated in Christ is concerned you are greatness on your way to happen. Listen, this is not motivation. You have to believe this. The Bible says, Savior shall come out of Zion. He's not talking about God. He's talking about us. Revelations 5 and verse 10. And has been made unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. The Bible calls you the light of the world, the salt of the earth. Matthew 5, 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. Matthew um, 5 14 if the salt has uh, you are the light of the world verse 15 it says neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel verse 16 let your light so shine he calls you the light he calls you ambassadors 
he calls you a blessing genesis 12 2 and 3 in this shall all the families of the earth be blessed you can't meet me and go back the same it's not pride it's the truth the bible says i am a blessing because he was spoken to Abraham and his seed. Galatians 3.29 And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now listen, you don't believe because you have become. You believe to become. Did you hear what I said? Waiting for a physical manifestation before you agree is not how the economy of the kingdom works. He said, let the weak say, you say I am strong to be strong. You don't wait till you are strong, then you verify. Mm -mm. A lie is not just an untrue statement. A lie is anything God did not say. Anything God did not say is considered a lie. So if God calls you great, that statement becomes true immediately, regardless what is happening around you. Is someone learning let me give you one more and then we'll continue tomorrow number three hmm. see listen 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 I just feel inspired to give you one more scripture on this point too this knowing who you are you see your I the dexterity of your knowing yourself is revealed in your speaking there is a way you speak that shows clearly that the light of God has not come to you Give us Isaiah 8 20. Don't forget this scripture for the rest of your life. This just came to my spirit. Let's read together. Isaiah 8 20. Ready? One to read. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. There is a way men who carry light speak. Because they understand that where the word of a king is, there is power. Do you believe this? Let me give you number three. What is the third dimension of knowledge and light? Remember what we are teaching? Empowered by light. Someone will leave this place tonight changed. Like you will, there is a healthy confidence. Something will begin to happen to you as a man of God. You will now begin to see the richness, the depth of the things of God. Number three, you must know your place in God's program and in destiny. This is the third level of light you must contend for. Please write. You must know your place in God's program and in destiny. If you do not have this knowledge, you will live a frustrated, defeated life. You must know your place. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a place for everybody in God's program. You will be angry, you will be jealous, you will be envious. You will hate yourself and, and vent that anger on others. If you do not know and you cannot find your place in God's prophetic picture, Everyone in this auditorium, or at least most of the people in front, are seated. Please come, my friend. You two, please come. Two of you, please come. No, just stand where you are. Just walk around, scatter yourselves. All of them have their seats, regardless the fact that they are scattered. You will not be, with respect to sitting, you are not angry, you are not envious. You are aware of your seat. It's still there. Show me your seat. No, 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 don't go. Just point it. Show me your own seat, sir. Show me your own seat, sir. Show me your own seat, sir. No confusion. Their confidence is based on the fact that regardless where they are, they can point to their position. Now, watch this. My friend, come. You come. You come. How many of them are here? Four. How many seats are there? Gently try to go and sit down. All three of you. All four, try to sit down in those two seats. Look at the confusion that will happen. Somebody must be angry. Somebody must be jealous. Are you seeing the drama that is happening? Thank you. You're good actors. Give them a good hand clap. Hallelujah. 
listen to me the foundation for jealousy and envy and all these petty things that have plagued the body of Christ is the bankruptcy of this light knowing that there is a space in destiny with your name connected and there are souls connected to that name there is a description my God Jeremiah 1 verse 5 it says from when you were a baby whilst you were in your mother's womb before you came forth God is not scratching his head wondering what to do with you in Ghana no you came as a conclusion of a divine discussion. Hallelujah. The third dimension of light. We are all gathered today celebrating God in Takoradi because a man found his place. Are we together? Now, you imagine... You imagine that Bishop and his wife at their age just came for a conference like this hoping to find his place. Count the number of people tied to his grace and count the number of years they would have been waiting because one man did not find his place. Only God knows how many prophets are in your loins still waiting. How many apostles in your loins. How many businessmen, financiers. How many heads of government. You don't believe what I'm saying? Let me show you in Genesis 17 and verse 6. Read it as a prophecy. That within every man, I will make thee exceeding fruitful. And I will make nations of thee. And kings shall come out of thee. That means for every man you are seeing is a composite of many destiny is connected to him refusing to find your prophetic place in life would be limiting many imagine if Jesus did not come imagine if there were no apostle Paul let me show you how many books of the Bible will be absent because one man was absent imagine if Matthew was not there Mark was not there imagine if Esther was not there who will teach us on favor imagine if Ruth was not there do you know what you call the Bible is simply men finding their place and fulfilling their assignment the exploits of their lives were canonized and archived and kept for us to learn are there books that will be written when your life is done so that people will know that somebody walked through Ghana that God brought a prophet indeed that God brought an apostle a kingdom financier a politician is someone learning so you must know God, the first level of light. You must know yourself in light of who Christ is. Number three, you must know and find your place in destiny. I'm wrapping up already. Let me give you a scripture, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Hebrews 10, 7. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me not to roam around, not to look for trouble, not to just call myself a Ghanaian or an African or a Zimbabwean, a Nigerian, to do your will, O oh God. In Luke chapter 4, the Bible says the scroll of Isaiah was given to Jesus and he found where it was written concerning him. Have you found where it was written concerning you? Because everybody's destiny has a parallel in scripture. When you stay with the Holy Spirit, you will suddenly find out. I feel tempted to add one more. Is that a good temptation? Number four. What is the fourth dimension of light that you must contend for? If you want to be empowered by light, you must understand the mysteries and the principles of the kingdom this will be the last for tonight and then the remaining two will take it up tomorrow you must understand the mysteries and the principles of the kingdom goodness 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 i can spend the whole night on this fourth point job 38 33 Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven, and canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? He was speaking to Job. Do you know how heaven regulates itself, and can you reproduce that dominion upon the earth? Listen to me. 
Dominion is not an impartation. You may have heard me say, it is the resultant effect of your comprehending the mysteries of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 10 and 13 now and verse 10, it has been given unto you, 13, 10, because it has been given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, 13, 10, Matthew 13, 10, because it has been given to you. Did I get that right? Look for it for me, please. Matthew chapter 13 and verse what now? 11, my apologies. It has been given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Please look at me. The reason why you call a doctor a doctor, the reason why you call an architect an architect is because there is a technical know-how as far as their skill is concerned. Am I right on that? So when someone says, I am a consultant, say maybe a consultant gynecologist or a pediatrician, you expect that there is a high level technical skill through learning and experience such that medical cases within their practice should not be an issue as much as possible. Is that true? And the, the difference between a consultant and a medical student in medical college now is not just their age necessarily. It is the abundance of light and knowledge backed up by years of pragmatic practice and experience. That is what translated the once medical student to now a consultant. This is true also in the kingdom. Most believers do not understand the principles of the kingdom. Again, it might interest you to know that the Bible is divided into three sections. You always, whenever you study the Bible, you are encountering three realities. Number one, promises. Number two, principles. Number three, prophecies. Every time you open your Bible, you are encountering these three realities. One, promises. God's commitment to us. Two, principles, the modus operandi of the kingdom, how the kingdom functions. For instance, when you want to prosper in the kingdom, say financially, you don't shadow box and guess your way. The way people prosper in the world system is not the same. There are principles that can be adopted, but the kingdom has a certain, certain principles. For instance, in the kingdom, you must know that God is the owner of all things. We don't own things in this kingdom. We are only stewards. And the Bible says, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You don't need that knowledge in the secular. But in the kingdom system, you need to understand this. That everything belongs to God and we are only stewards. Then you now begin to apply the laws of diligence, relationships, value, productivity, giving, and all these spiritual laws together. You see that? You need to know the ways of God. Why do you pray? Do you know why? Why do you fast? Do you know why? Why do you study? Why do you have to speak the word of God? Why do you come to church? Why do you have to love even the unlovable? When you understand the ways of God, you practice the truths and the principles of the kingdom, not as a religious ritual, but now with understanding. I know you fast. My question is why? Do you know the relevance, the role that fasting plays in the overall growth and maturity and stability of the believer? Why do you give? I sat here and I watched many of you giving. So my heart was so touched by your love for Jesus and your giving. But why do you give? Why do you sing? How does someone who is surrounded by challenges, ladies and gentlemen, will lock himself or herself in a room, write all your challenges and start singing and dancing around it? What formula is that? Where did you learn that from? What role does it play? The things that are written aforetime, the Bible says, they are for our learning so that we through patience and the comfort of scripture might find hope. Many believers are in ignorance as to the ways of God. So if someone comes to tell you, I've been attacked by demon spirits, as a matured Christian, or so you say, recommend the way out for him. Let me hear what you will tell him. Usually we'll say, let's pray. And we'll say anything and just say in Jesus' name. And we know that that person's solution has not come. We just ask him to go so that we can find peace. But we know in truth that that person is not going to be free because that does not look like the formula. 
When someone comes and tells you, I've been rejected, nobody loves me, I'm sincere, but it looks like good things, friends and good things go away. As a believer who understands the way of God, what is your recommendation to such a person? Again, let's pray. What are you going to say? You see that there is a lot of ignorance in the body of Christ. We have a lot of gaps in our spiritual understanding. And the Lord has put a conference like this to bring us close. Please don't miss tomorrow. I'm going to be sharing with you certain mysteries of the kingdom. And help by the spirit to connect some of these dots. That with precision you can know you are a blessing. With the, with the intelligence of a consultant you can see a believer and literally diagnose the problem in a moment. And then you can help people with exactitude and precision. You can know that this family is in bondage because of this and this is the way. And happy are you if you are a pastor. Imagine what happens to your church this Sunday. That you go back with this upgraded knowledge and you look at your dear people and say, ladies and gentlemen, the one you used to know is not the one preaching now. Sit down and let me show you with confidence the way of the kingdom. And you return by next week with testimonies because the truth that you know has opened men to vistas of new possibilities you believe this this is how much God loves you to bring you this truth every time God has compassion upon men he does not help them by bringing sentiments he sends his word understanding is the key to dominion empowered by light that was the true light that lighted every man from the abundance of this knowledge now impartation can come and when you receive that impartation you will not make a fool of yourself it will last there is longevity to your impact because the impartation is resting upon knowledge let me recap and then pray I gave you four dimensions of light that represent the knowledge you must intentionally pursue if you desire to be empowered by light. Number one, the knowledge of God and of his son Jesus Christ. Number two, the knowledge of yourself in light of who Christ is. Number three, remember? Give me number three. Yes. Hallelujah. Your place, your prophetic position and your place in destiny someone needs to return back home this night and say lord i'm tired of escorting men roaming around rigma rolling any road that looks like destiny lord what did you call me to do what is my place where is in in your prophetic program for ghana and africa where do i stand and he will answer because the bible says call unto me and i will answer i will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not and then number four, the last for tonight, you must have an understanding of the mysteries and the principles of the kingdom. The mysteries and the principles of the kingdom. Listen to me. Longevity has a mystery that controls it. Favor has a mystery that controls it. Speed has a mystery that controls it. Influence has a mystery that controls it. Are we together now? Walking in the gifts of the Spirit has a mystery that controls it. Being loved and regarded by all and sundry, honor, all of these dimensions in the kingdom, the Bible simply calls them exceeding great and precious promises that by them we might be partakers of his divine nature, it says, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Exceeding great and precious promises, shrouded in mysteries. My final talk with you tonight is which of them do you not know? Do you know the key that controls speed? Do you know the key that controls longevity in this wicked demonic world? Or are you waiting until you die? Do you know the mysteries that control authentic, lasting kingdom wealth? Not manipulation and pranks and telling lies and living a fake life. Being blessed with the dignity of kingdom integrity. Do you know the mystery that controls final and total liberty? 
from curses, yokes. Can I tell you the truth is that everyone at some point or the other is connected to something that has to do with bloodline. It is our understanding of what Christ has done and then our knowing how to appropriate it. Knowing what Christ has done does not bring you liberty. It is knowing how to appropriate it with intelligence. Are we together? Yes. You can buy a new gadget, a fridge for instance, and never be able to use it. It never cools anything, but it is new, no denial. It can cool, no denial. And yet you will be you will be thirsty you can buy an air conditioner and never be able to set it up yet it is new yet it is true if we say all those who have AC stand up you will stand up but all those who are enjoying the blessings of ACs you can't stand up this is how many believers are your salvation is a fact but the experience is not yet true this is why God brought us here can we stop for tonight rise up on your feet We're not done yet. I know that I've stretched you a bit, but give me two minutes and let's pray together. The prayer is part of the meeting. Two minutes and let's pray. One is a sincere cry. Lord, I'm tired of this level spiritually. I'm ready to stretch to a higher level in the spirit. Someone pray. Let tonight's teaching provoke you. Whether you are a pastor, you are a prophet, you are an apostle, a co-laborer. One of the things that this teaching tonight has done is to shake you and challenge you. The days of nominal Christianity, shouting and jumping over nothing, is, is, is decently coming to an end. God is raising a people of knowledge, power, stature, maturity, dexterity, and intelligence. Lift your voice and pray. Father, it's time to encounter you genuinely. Encounter you genuinely. Ah, the generations connected to me. I can't fail my world. I can't fail my generation in the name of Jesus Christ. Stand to contend for light. That was the true light that lighted every man. One minute, pray. My dear people outside, make sure you're praying. Light, light in the name of Jesus. Light as a man of God. Light as a businessman. Light as a leader. As an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teaching priest. Lord, I'm tired of ignorance that has pegged me at the same level. Let's dive into the deep waters of the spirit. Can you raise a cry for one minute? Ah, let my Christian experience be rich. Please pray. And we will never settle for less. We know there's more that's found in you. And we will never settle for less. When we know there's more that's found in you. What you see is not all there is. For someone here, what is happening tonight is the dream God has been showing you. That this level you are in spiritually, you can't take the nations that way. Your mantle, the mantle of your destiny has been looking for you. But not the weak you, not the ignorant you, not the prayerless you. Oh Deborah, Esther, Ruth, it is true you are destined for glory. But until you contend for knowledge and for grace and for power by illumination, the light of his word. I came tonight to challenge a preacher. I came tonight to provoke you unto godliness. As a fellow servant, I came to challenge someone. It's time for low level knowledge. High level illumination is what God is calling us into. Preachers, blazing light. 
blazing revelation. someone your retreat starts tonight ah your retreat starts tonight you will go back home and sleep will not come you will wake up and hold on to the horns of the altar it's time for the gates of my destiny to be open it's time for the gates of my destiny nominal christianity goodbye shallow christianity goodbye it's time to do business in deep waters deep waters in the spirit deep waters ascending in the spirit for high level illumination hallelujah in jesus name just help that lady under the anointing let me just speak over you tomorrow Please, I do not want you to miss tomorrow because our impartation starts tomorrow and then we'll finish it up in the night. I want to show you some things by the Spirit of the Living God. I truly believe with all my heart. I know that God sent me to everybody, but let me beseech servants of the Living God, men and women of God, those who labor in word and doctrine, as much as God grants grace, please do not miss these sessions. There is what we need to hear. We came to strengthen ourselves, not to outshine ourselves, to strengthen ourselves. But there is what you need. I want to reveal to you God's prophetic blueprint for the season. You need to know what God is doing. It's a right for these words are faithful and true. I will speak over your life tonight. Our time is fast stretched. Father, I'm praying for everybody, but particularly for someone here whose hunger for you has gotten to its limit and they need to encounter you. Father, the grace for encounters. Right now, I stretch my hands. May the grace that brings men, that river of encounter, let that grace rest on you now. Let it rest on you now. Let that grace rest on you now. By reason of this grace, his angel will wake you up in the night and begin to show you things yes. that you do not know. Show you things that you have never seen. He will begin to describe for you God's prophetic agenda. He will open up the vista scripture so that you will see in a way you have not seen before. Yes. In the name of Jesus Christ. For some of you as you go to sleep tonight, may you have dreams that open up the blueprint of your destiny. Hallelujah. Do you believe what you are receiving? Hear me. There are some of you, there are certain relationships you will respectfully wave goodbye from this night because the kind of hunger that has come upon you, you, you mean business with God and with destiny. Hallelujah. I'm told tomorrow we're here about 8.30 or 9. Whatever, even if it is in the morning you come, come, don't just sit down and be gisting around. While you are waiting, be praying in the spirit. I'm enlarging my capacity. While you are praying, see the destinies connected to you, saying thank you for being diligent. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. 9 a.m. and then 5 a.m. in the evening. I will instruct you by morning on what to do in the evening. But I can assure you that you have not experienced a conference like this before. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. For those of you in front, God bless you. You can return to your seat. I want to make an altar call. And I want you to listen. I want to make an altar call. There is a gentleman here. The prophetic is on you. This is what I'm seeing. I'm not ministering already, but I just want to obey the Lord. The prophetic is on you. Carry that gentleman and bring him for me. The power of God will come on him now. for me. The power of God will come on two of them now. Add them to this. There is one person outside. I know it's a distance, but I just saw fire. Rest on one person outside. Bring the person for me. people out it is not for a show in the name of Jesus that deliverer mantle I release it upon you now I release it upon you now I come by the rod of a higher priesthood I release it upon you now ah you will walk in dimensions you have not seen by the spirit of the living God you will walk in levels in the spirit you have not seen before in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus and for the gentlemen, I begin to fan that prophetic flame. Ah, the eyes that see and the ears that hear. In the name of Jesus Christ. For the seeing eye and the hearing ear belongs to the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Please do not miss tomorrow. There are some of you who need to call some people that you know. Maybe not everybody, but whilst you are here, the Holy Ghost is telling you, this brother needs to be here. This sister, it may even be your loved one. This is beyond just a meeting and a crowd. This is a kairos. It's called a prophetic gathering. In the name of Jesus, the Lord brought you out here and every grace that should rest on you, I release it now. To the glory of the name of the Lord. To the glory of the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Now I want to make an altar call. When I began my teaching I told you. That the beginning of the believer's journey does not start with coming to church. Does not even start with encountering a pastor, prophet or apostle. No. The foundation, the commencement of the believers journey once they are fine they can be back to their seats those under the anointing you can just leave them there is a reason why now hear me please 
the business of playing games with Jesus must come to an end in this end time you see you cannot continue to shadow box and dilly dal no it says if Baal be God serve him if God be God serve him in every gathering like this we have a crowd of people in the auditorium scattered across many outside and thousands others following online by way of television and even by way of a rebroadcast in a meeting like this the Lord adds daily as many as should be saved there has to be someone in this place tonight who is an apostle give me an opportunity to make it right with Jesus perhaps you have been around church perhaps you have a Christian name perhaps you come from a Christian family none of these in themselves equal salvation you need an encounter with Jesus the Son of the Living God or perhaps there's someone here who is saying I remember I made that decision but right now I cannot truly say that I'm walking with God in truth my life has gone haywire and I need a restoration now let me give you an instruction as you come for the sake of those who are in front so you don't march on them please be mindful of them I'm going to count one to five the moment the stage is filled up here you will stand wherever you are maybe the aisles those outside you need not come in you can just move to your projector screen or anywhere where there's an official there to make it easy but I want to count one to five we need to take this serious I'm not calling everybody but I'm calling someone who is sincere and saying I will not lie to myself I need to make it right with Jesus and when I begin to count, don't wait for someone to be the first to come before you come be mindful again repeat of those who are in front so you don't injure them just smuggle your way through any space you can find in front I begin my counting now one come Ghana is this how you celebrate salvation two where would I be if you let me come where would I be come if you let to Jesus it is never too late to make it right with Jesus win that war of destiny your children will say thank you those connected to you will say thank you don't sit back saying they know me or they can see me no come and mean it serious with Jesus mean business with him tonight apostle I want to come but I'm not yet sure come come you can be sure once and for all Hallelujah. I salute all of you inside and those outside. And for someone who is following in your home, your office, following by way of television, as I lead these precious people to make that prayer, that call to salvation, make sure that you make it. You're not reciting a poem. Let it be from the depth of your heart. I congratulate all of you for the boldness to come and stand before Jesus. The Bible says, as many who will come to him, he will in no wise cast away. Young and old, you're coming here, and thank you for that, that boldness. Let me request that you lift your right hand high above your head as a sign of surrender, and say this as loud and as clear as you can. Say, Lord Jesus, tonight I have heard your word. I declare that I love you with all my heart. I declare that you are my savior you are my lord and you are my king i declare that from today the power of sin satan hell and the grave is broken over my life i am a child of god i have the life of god i go from glory to glory and grace to grace amen Keep your hands lifted. Father, thank you for these precious ones. Thank you because only you are able to do this. You have brought them. Lord, keep them. Based on the authority of scripture, I declare their sins forgiven. And I call you bona fide recipients of the life of God. The power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken over your life. 
And in the name of Jesus, I call you. Don't just turn around, walk to one, two, three, four people. Make sure you are counting. And only return to your seat when you get to number four. Hallelujah. Amen. Bishop, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. There are things that you only receive in the house of the Lord. You cannot receive it in a bank. You cannot receive it in a museum. You cannot receive it even in a school. I made a statement to, I think, a week or two back home. I said, the house of the Lord, the church of Jesus Christ, is the cheapest platform for transformation. Because if you are to be part of transformation through a secular institution, you will need to write an exams. You will need to qualify. Perhaps they will have regional quotas that they have to take. Are we together? Yes. You need to be within an age range. To be admitted in certain institutions but all it takes to come to the house of god is your desire and that's it so it is the cheapest platform for transformation hallelujah let's lift our hands to jesus and ask him again to speak to us talk to the lord in one minute speak to me oh god speak to my life speak to my destiny the entrance of your word gives light and understanding unto the simple ask him for a visitation ask him for a very strong visitation upon your spirit man father give us strong visitations this morning you pray the Bible says ye have not because ye ask not so for everyone that asketh the Bible says he receiveth he that told you have asked for nothing he says ask and you shall receive that your joy might be full for in Jesus mighty name we have prayed Holy Spirit, we pray that you breathe upon us, breathe upon the word. Let it produce light and understanding unto our spirits. And we pray that this session will be mighty upon us as far as transformation is concerned. Visit us so greatly and be glorified. In Jesus' matchless name we have prayed. God bless you. Please be seated. So we began yesterday discussing the role of light as far as the empowerment of the saints is concerned. We examined a few things yesterday and we said that it is the desire of God as revealed in scripture that number one, all men be saved and then that after they are saved through Jesus Christ that they come into the knowledge of the truth. And we did agree yesterday that the stability of the believer is predicated upon his access to light, high level spiritual illumination. We said to have light alone is not sufficient. You must have light to the degree that can drive away darkness. Hallelujah. And um, I did tell us yesterday, just a quick recap, that light in scripture expresses three things. One, knowledge remember two manifestation in fact the bible defines light as that which makes manifest and then number three glory it says arise shine for your light is come and the glory of the lord so light is connected to glory hallelujah and i said that dominion in any area is a function of sufficient light you do not walk practically in dominion over elemental forces, over the vicissitudes of life, commanding your reality. It will only happen at the instance of light. One more thing I said yesterday is that 
no matter how long darkness has been, it does not matter when light comes. Remember my example yesterday? So if a room has been dark for decades, years, months, weeks, days, hours, maybe minutes, the moment you switch on your light, if it is light indeed, it drives darkness instantly without discussion. John 1, 5. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Hallelujah. And I told us we must press for knowledge. Knowledge that gives us true dominion in this kingdom. So that we're not just professing Christians. We're not just Christians who potentially have the life of God and yet cannot demonstrate it, but that we must translate the kingdom experience from prophecy, from potential to experience. Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus in John 3, when you read 2 to 5, he says, except ye be born again, you cannot see the kingdom. Then he now says in verse 5, except ye be born of water and of the spirit, he says ye cannot enter. Now this is the experience of the kingdom where you can taste and see that the Lord is good. And by the way, I hope you know that the dominion of the saints is how Jesus is glorified. Hallelujah. Now, in theology, there's what we call the reflection principle. No object glorifies itself. It invests its glory in something outside of itself, and the excellence of that which is outside itself is how the object is glorified. So the father does not glorify himself. The glory is invested in the son. The excellence of the son is how the father is glorified. The son does not glorify himself. He invests his glory in the church in partnership with the Holy Ghost. Are we together? So the excellence of the church is how the son is glorified. The church, the saints, do not glorify themselves. It is their dominion over elemental forces, over principalities and powers. That is how the church is glorified. So the church, in partnership with the Holy Spirit, reveal and glorify the Son, and the Son brings glory to the Father. John 17, 1. Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven to pray, and he said, Father, the hour is come. 17, 1 of John. He says, glorify thy son, that thy son may bring glory to you. 17 and verse 1, John. John 17 and verse 1. Glorify thy son, that thy son may glorify thee. Hallelujah. It's important that believers bear fruits. The Bible says in John 15 and verse 8, Herein is our Father glorified. When ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. John 15, 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Are we together? Ephesians 2, 10. It says we are his workmanship, recreated or created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had preordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 3.10, Paul was speaking to the church in Ephesus and he says to the intent that now unto principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold, multifaceted wisdom of God. Hallelujah. John, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, he says to permit your light to so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father which is in heaven so the dominion of the saints is how god is glorified if you truly love the lord and you truly desire to see him glorified it will not just be by singing and dancing it will not just be by prayer you would want his life to find expression in and through you to the end that jesus be glorified are we together So, yesterday, I said how that every aspect of every result that we desire in the kingdom has a light component, a knowledge component that activates it. And I'll begin my teaching from there now. Years ago, I had a vision. 
and the Lord would teach me this very practically and in that vision I was caught up in the spirit and I saw a giant gate an ancient gate and that gate was made up of smaller doors just like post office boxes and they were opening and closing as I watched opening many of them opening and closing and every time that small door opened light would emanate from it and on every of those small boxes were written scriptures and then the Holy Ghost told me that every scripture you see has a grace component behind it that empowers the saints to walk in the reality of it so every time you catch a revelation that light from that scripture enters you and you are now empowered to be a living epistle as far as that dimension of reality is concerned so prosperity in the kingdom has a body of knowledge that controls it longevity in the kingdom has a body of knowledge that controls it divine health and vitality has a body of knowledge that controls it impact and influence has a body of knowledge that controls it the assignment of the teaching priest like i said yesterday is to methodically teach and guide the saints from one mystery to another are we together now so that when you have been in church for a while you should literally surround yourself with the mysteries of the kingdom like chariots and therein lies your dominion that when you stand before any door you know how to open it you can live long you can walk in health you can walk in joy and vitality you can literally exert dominion over elemental forces over strange spirits that attempts to thwart the destinies of men and this is why we are here I told us yesterday that there are six dimensions of knowledge six dimensions of light that every believer must access to be relevant as a witness to be relevant as an ambassador to be relevant as light and as salt hallelujah by the way maybe it may interest you let me just state this very quickly and then we'll finish where we left off that believers are classified in scripture in twofold there is our classification based on identity then there is our classification based on function and assignment don't forget that when the bible classifies believers we are classified twofold number one based on our identity so Jesus says I am the vine is that true and then he says we are branches so that is classification based on identity for instance we are called heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ the purpose of that classification is to help us understand the extent of our oneness Ephesians 6 verse 10 he says finally brethren be strong in the Lord in fact when you read from amplified i wish we could get amplified of that scripture it says draw your strength from your union with him so that your strength is derived be empowered from your union with him the consciousness of your oneness with him are we together the branch never struggles to get nutrients from the ground because it is connected to the vine connected to the root so believers are classified based on identity but believers are classified based on function so we use these words like you are light you are salt you are ambassadors acts 1 8 you are witnesses unto me you are kings and priests revelations 5 10 all of these classifications attempt to describe our assignments not just our oneness but our function hallelujah so back to the five dimensions of knowledge number one yesterday we said the first dimension of knowledge that the believer must access light indeed is that you must know God and his son Jesus Christ are we together very important number two we said you must know yourself in light of who Christ is your identity in Christ is a major requirement if you must walk in the experience of victory number three we said you must know yourself in God's program and in destiny your prophetic place as far as God's program is concerned 
this will be the cure for complex inferiority, jealousy, pain, anger, and all those petty flesh attributes that they are literally cured when you find your place in God's program. Number four, we said you must understand the mysteries and the principles of the kingdom. Did you write that down yesterday? Yes. That you literally excel in the kingdom when you have an understanding of the mysteries, the modus operandi of the kingdom. Before Moses would cry for the glory of God, he said, show me your ways. And then later on, he would say, show me your glory. Hallelujah. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16 encourages us to stand in the way. It says, and see and ask for the old path, wherein is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your soul. So there is a way that leads to life, and there is a way that leads to destruction. In fact, the Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. It is not right, but it seemeth right. We don't know how long it can seem right. It can seem right for 20 years of your life, only to find out you were wasting your time. It says, but the end thereof are the ways of destruction. Let's do number five now. Continuing from where we left off yesterday. Number five. What is the fifth kind of light that every believer who desires to do business with God in this end time must contend for? Are you ready? You must understand man as the zenith of God's creation. Just write this one and please listen carefully. You must understand man, M-A-N, man as the zenith of God's creation. Can I tell you? In all your learning and in all your knowledge, if you do not understand man, you will live a defeated life as far as the cosmos is concerned. You must know God, you must know yourself, but you must understand the world of men. Two scriptures, Psalm 8, 1 to 6, a scripture that has blessed me for so many years. O Lord our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth who has set the glory above the heavens, reading to verse 6. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. Verse 3. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, nor the son of man that thou visitest him. Keep four. We're going back to four, please. And then we'll do five. Just go back to four. What is man? The psalmist is asking a question. He's saying, I have considered all the works that you have created, but none of your creation commands your jealousy and attention like man. So what is in man that is not in plants? What is in man that is not in the sea? Why are you so attentive to man? When plants fade, you leave them to go and another season comes. But when man falls, you are quick to send a prophet. What is in man? Is it that you put something in man that even men do not know? What is man that thou art mindful? Are you not so powerful? Why do you come? You see, the nation of Israel would walk against the ways of God and they usually would be given to their enemies. Now in slavery and servitude and pain and loss and despair, they will cry unto God and here he comes again. God was not ashamed to demonstrate his vulnerability towards man. So the psalmist studied this and said, no, there has to be something about this man. Is it that you cannot wipe them away and create a new race of obedient people? Remove their will and let them be a species of totally obedient people. How come the same man, you will bless them, they will sin against you, walk against your ways and go to worship other gods and say, God, we are not interested in you. And God will say, okay, fine. After a while, by himself, he will now look for a prophet and say, talk to these people. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with my loving kindness. Are we learning now? What is in man that makes God so vulnerable as though he's lost his power? That God sits in the heaven and all he's thinking about is man. It's in your Bible. The Bible reveals the thoughts of God. How could such a mighty God, the monarch of the universe, 
He's not thinking about any plan whatsoever. He sent Jesus because of man, created things because of man, fought Satan because of man. Jesus is at the right hand interceding because of man. Everything in heaven because of man. What is man? If God is asking that question, you better ask it too. What is man? That means there is something deeply mysterious about man. Hallelujah. In a teaching series called Let Them Have Dominion, I taught about what the condition it takes to be a man. Because not everybody is man. Not everyone on earth can be called man. There are three conditions, and that's not my teaching, but there are three conditions for you to be called man. Not everybody is man. That is why redemption is not for everybody. Angels are not men. They can't be saved. Are we together? For you to be a man, you first have to be a spirit. If you are not a spirit, you can't be a man. Number two, that spirit must reside within a mortal body. If that spirit is not trapped within a mortal body, it cannot be called man. Then that spirit must have the solical faculties of the will, emotion, and intellect operating at the same time. That tripartite reality is what turns that species to be called man. Hallelujah. So when the Bible says, what is man that thou art mindful of? You can't call a fish a man. You can't call a dog a man. There are animals that look like men, but they are not men. Are we together? Animals can be trained to be so intelligent. I mean, science has gone so far. They train animals. Some of them can almost talk. So intelligent. They understand languages. You go, our military people across the globe have trained dogs. They have trained all kinds of animals. They have extracted and stretched their intelligence, but they are not men. As simple and frail as man is, he has created a metallic object that can fly 35, 40,000 feet above sea level and to transport him from one place to the other. The great oil mines, the great mansions across the globe were not made by animals. They were made by men. This mic that I'm using to amplify my voice was the creativity of man. The only reason why money is important is because there are men, not animals. Take away all the men in the world and open all the banks. Let you be the only one who is alive. Everything only finds its relevance because there are men. Unfortunately, Believers do not study men. And this is why we fail so woefully. It is important to know God. But it is important also, not equally important, but important to know man. So the fifth kind of light you must contend for is you must understand man as the zenith of God's creation. Second scripture. Did we finish that scripture, by the way? Let's finish it. Psalm 8, 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. Verse 5. It says, for thou hast made him a little lower than angels. Is the word Elohim. The word there is literally God. You have made him lower than God. And crowned him with glory and honor. Let's read verse 6 together. One, two, read. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands uh -huh, and has put how many things under his feet all things now paul in quoting this scripture in hebrews chapter 2 he adds a lot of life to this scripture he says and in doing so he left nothing that was not put under his feet then he says but now we do not yet see all things under his feet but sufficient for you to know that in God's mind and his economy, the highest, the zenith of his creation is man. As beautiful as the oceans are, wonderful oceans, rivers, and you have a lot of them here. And I can imagine the scenery. People spend millions of dollars to build vacation homes just to have access to that scenery. I remember years ago, where was that now? That should be Gambia. I was kept somewhere very, very beautiful, just like your region here. And I was kept somewhere just overseeing the ocean. 
and I said, oh Lord, I am safe in this place. No river, no ocean whatsoever comes to meet me here. I mean, the waters were getting boisterous and I said, I hope these people are aware that their homes just close to the seashore. <laughs> you know, you are sleeping in the night and that sound wakes you and you say, no, 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 he shall keep his angels charge over me. <laughs> Hallelujah. But are we together now? Yes. He made him, he gave him dominion over all the works of his hands and put all things under your feet. Whether you walk in the experience of this truth or not does not change the fact that this is how God designed us to function. Today, unfortunately, we see that most of what should be under our feet is above us and we are slaves to creation and elemental forces. This is why God has put this conference together. One more scripture. Psalm 115 and verse 16. Psalm 115 verse 16. Psalm 115, 115 and 16. Psalm 115 and 16. Psalm 115. Thank you. Let's read together. One to read. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord. Uh huh. But the earth hath he given to the children of men. Read the B part, please. But the earth has he given to the children of men. One more time. But the earth has he given to the children of men. This scripture is so powerful that God himself made it scripturally wrong for him to invade the earth, even though he's the creator outside of the corporation of man. When it was time, when God said, let them have dominion, that was a very implicating statement. That means I will never do anything in the earth without the cooperation of one man. Not the permission, the cooperation. Most people say the permission, no. God is still God, but he requires the cooperation of man to the extent that Jesus was delayed until God finally found a virgin willing to donate her womb for Jesus to arrive. If Mary refused, God will respect her will and have to start searching for another virgin because there was no prophecy in the Bible that the name of the virgin who will birth Emmanuel will be Mary. Mary simply partnered with prophecy. The same way there was no prophecy that the man to betray him will be called Judas. Judas saw that script and played to that script. Hallelujah. Are you learning now? So the Bible says the earth has he given to the children of men. Do you know what that means? If you know God and you do not know men, you will only enjoy spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. But as far as the earth is concerned, you will live such a defeated life. And this is where when believers are not mentored to understand the cosmos, you see, they, we are spiritual, we can fall down, we can stand up, but as far as our excellence is concerned and kingdom advancement, we fail and we do so woefully. A few weeks ago, I was in your nation again to speak for the World Conference of the Full Gospel Businessmen Fellowship, and one of the teachings that I taught there was the wisdom of Egypt. The Bible tells us that even though Moses was a great spiritual man, he had to learn the wisdom of Egypt for him to reign. You notice every time God's people were reminded about the covenant, they would, you know, create monuments, altars, and, and then worship God. But every time God wanted to use them, he would send them to Egypt for their learning. That was true for Joseph. That was true for Moses. Are we together? Yeah. The wisdom of Egypt. Most believers do not understand the wisdom of the cosmos. So we fail in business, we fail in politics, we fail in every other aspect because there is no abundance of light. We do not understand men. And sometimes we make sincere mistakes like saying, I don't need any man. If you are saying that to describe the sovereign power of God, you are right. But if you are saying that as far as your work in the earth is concerned, you will be learning a slow but painful lesson through the years you have left. Hallelujah. Even God needed men. The problem of the man in John chapter 5, please give it to us. John chapter 5 from verse 1. There was a man who was in a pool called Bethesda. Let's go to verse 2. It says, a, 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 a porch there, Bethesda having five porches. Verse 3. It says, 
Give us verse 3 media. In this lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the movement of the water. Verse 4 now. It says, For an angel went down to a certain, in a certain season to steer the pool, trouble the water, and whoever was the first to jump into was made whole of whatever disease he had. Now verse 5. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity. How long? 38 years. This is one of the longest conditions we know that a man carried you know, a man carried a problem, a, a plague so long. We don't know how long Job's own lasted. We know that Abraham's own lasted for about 25 years. Now, this man had 38. The Bible says, and when Jesus saw him lie, he knew that he had been now a long time in that case. And he said unto him, will thou be made whole? Listen to the man's problem, verse 7. The impotent man answered him, sir. I have no man. This is my problem. It's not that I do not know where the healing is. I am aware that there is that possibility. But my limitation, what has multiplied my pain and kept me here for 38 years is not the sickness. The solution to it has all, it comes every year. But I have no man. It is dangerous to be alone. I have no man. There are many, many Christians who have no men. Many churches who have no men. Once upon a time, the apostle was afraid and God told him, do not be afraid to go into the city because I have many people. In the multitude of men is a king's honor. No matter what you have, if you do not have the advantage of men, you are in trouble. Is someone learning now? It takes men for men to rise. All blessings, you may have heard me say, comes from God through men to men. Let me say it again. All blessings come from God through men to men. Even salvation came from God through the man Jesus to men. Not through the God Jesus salvation came from god the father through the man jesus to men so if god says yes and men say no your yes remains yes only in the spirit as far as the physical realm is concerned your life will be full of no's for the rest of your life many of us are like this man i have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the man who was crippled who was healed at Jesus' crusade. He was not just healed because he was, he was um, um, most fortunate. He just had the opportunity of a few men who carried him and said, today you must be healed. And they tore the roof. It was no effort on his part. In fact, the Bible says when Jesus saw their faith, the men, in this kingdom who hates you does not matter. But who likes you matters. It truly does. Vashti, the king hates you and you cease becoming queen immediately. Esther, the king likes you even as a village girl and you become queen immediately. Hallelujah. The heaven of heavens belong to the Lord. But the earth has he given to the sons of men. Now, most people do not understand this. I wish I had all the time I would have shown you the dynamics of living in this cosmos because when God gave us the command be fruitful be fruitful means be relational everything multiplies fruitfulness is only through relationships biology teaches us that is that true the only exemption was Mary and don't you think it was really an exemption it was just a human exemption but the Holy Ghost came to play that fatherly role Everything multiplies when it is connected to something else. Except a corn of wheat relates with the ground by falling to it. It abides, it remains alone. But if it now unites with the earth, it can now produce. 
So when you are in, one of the ways that Satan destroys people is that through ignorance or pride, he isolates you from all the men that have been destined to hold your hands. In fact, one of the classic ways that Satan destroys men is to cause you to fight with everybody who can be used to lift you. When you are now alone and through offense, your destiny helpers are far, he will now strike you. In pride and pain, you will be alone. We are only alone when we are seeking God in terms of encounters. When it has to do with our dominion, two are better than one. For they have a good reward for their labor. Is that in your Bible? That one chases a thousand. It never said two chase two thousand. Two will put ten thousand to flight. So imagine what ten will do. Men are so powerful that Jesus said, if any two shall agree. It's the same God you are talking to, but he said, when two of you are now agreeing, it creates an effect that even God will have to respond to. Genesis 11, Nimrod Kush gathered men. There was no Holy Ghost there. There was no demon mentioned. It was only men. But because the men were united, he said, go to come. Let us make bricks and mortar and build a city whose top and whose tower will reach the heaven. And the Bible says that God had to look down and to see the city which men had already built. God himself had to come down and scatter them. Otherwise, he said God was testifying. Give us verse 5. This is God testifying. No mention of demons in that scripture. No mention of the Holy Spirit in that scripture. Verse 5. 11 and verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. Look at verse 6. God is testifying. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. Not behold the person. Behold, there are men who have come together in oneness. And they have all one language. And this they begin to do. Hear God's testimony about man. And now nothing shall be restrained from them which they, not him, have imagined to do. This is not an angel testifying. This is the creator of the ends of the earth. Who knows what he put in man? No wonder there is something you get in church that you cannot get. No matter how consecrated, how diligent you are. There are dimensions of God you will never get in your secret place until you come into the corporate gathering of the saints. For instance, Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It says it is like the oil, verse 2. That comes from the head of Aaron. Are we together? And down to his bed, to Aaron's skirt, and down to his garment. Verse 3. He now says, like the dew of Hammon, and the dew that descended upon the mountain of Zion. For there, in that gathering, the Lord had commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Hallelujah. Are we learning? You must understand men. Ladies and gentlemen, the answer to your prayer right now is in the hand of a man. That is the truth. That is the truth. What you are praying about, the lifting of Joseph came from God, but it was in the hand of Pharaoh. It was within his power. And when Pharaoh exercised that power, he said, I am Pharaoh. Genesis chapter 41, chapter 40, 40, chapter 41. I am Pharaoh and except in the throne would you be higher than me but as far as administration is concerned you are in charge immediately gave him a signet ring decorated him with honor are we together now and gave him a name and then caused him to marry Potiphera the priest the daughter of Potiphera the priest of on honor came to him automatically in one moment how about King Nebuchadnezzar how look there are men who are so powerful you cannot cast them the only way God helps you is to grant you favor with them they are gatekeepers you can't pray them away the Bible says when a man's ways pleases the Lord he maketh his enemies there are some enemies you cannot cast away they are gatekeepers even God recognizes their authority he will grant you favor with them otherwise that door will be closed forever I hope you are learning because someone you are here ignoring your boss ignoring everybody and say what is there is it just because you are a millionaire and you are the one suffering you see believers need to have spiritual intelligence if you want to reign and dominate in the cosmos relationships are powerful 
the hardest currency on earth are relationships not dollars not pounds no that is poor education if you buy everything with money I taught you last year when I came here by the truth I taught you that if you use money to buy everything in your life wisdom is not at work in your life there are many things that should be written paid for by relationships <laughs> hallelujah Jesus is on his way to Golgotha ladies and gentlemen your Jesus going to die not for his sin for the sin of the world and he had bled from the beating the Bible tells us that he was so weak he had lost strength because the life of the flesh is in the blood he had lost so much strength he fell down and they had to bring a man called Simon of Cyrene is that in your Bible and he held the cross for Jesus Jesus did not say leave me I am Savior I would die alone he needed that help otherwise Jesus would have died on the ground watch this if Jesus died on the ground your sins will not be saved because it is written curse is the one who hangs on a tree he had to die on the tree not on the ground if Jesus died on the ground it will not be mission accomplished he had to die as a curse on a tree for it is written the Bible says cursed is everyone that hanged on the tree that the blessings of Abraham justification by faith might come upon we the Gentiles to the end that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith that's what the Bible teaches a man how about the dead Jesus on the cross that body was lying lifeless there and nobody had the power and the influence to bring it down no angel angels could roll away the stone but they could not bring the body of Jesus down from the cross it took a man of influence called Joseph of Arimathea that man had a he had a virgin tomb it belonged to him he had influence with the kings of the day he said give me the body of the man and they brought Jesus otherwise without a man you would never say oh death where is your sting oh grave where would be the grave in the first place I want to show you the role that men played as powerful as Jesus is and was when he was on earth there were three men that activated his destiny number one is called Simon the Serene a man called the prophet Simon number two the second was called um, or Simeon the prophet I meant to say my apologies Simeon the prophet number two was Hannah the prophetess number three John the prophet who you call the Baptist these three men had to pray for Jesus and release him to excel the Holy Ghost never came until he honored these three men listen believers do not understand the power of men your media people ask me a question um, one brilliant gentleman who was interviewing me yesterday, he asked me a question and he said, Apostle, why are you back here again? I said, I'm back here because I love your pastor, because I believe what God is doing here and because I love Ghana. I do. It's true. Hallelujah. I was teasing them yesterday and I told them that I will get an affiliate citizenship. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. But you get my point. Don't go around hating people and say, it doesn't matter, I know the Holy Spirit. You will really suffer. You will. I assure you. And this is not a prophecy. I'm telling you by wisdom, don't go around pushing men. You push your destiny helpers, your divine connectors, the men of influence in your life. You push gifted people. You push burden bearers and say, it does not matter. You will need to swallow your pride. Restore certain relationships. Swallow your pride. Listen. Listen to me. When God in Genesis chapter 12, are you learning? Am I wasting your time? When God in Genesis chapter 12 called Abraham, he was called alone. He was called alone. Given all the blessings, I will make your name great. And Lot just put his ears and said, what is God telling this man? And when he heard it, Abraham was about to go. Lot said, no way. God did not call me, but I will follow the one God called and watch this when we get to genesis chapter 13 everything abraham had 
Abraham had, Lot had, to the extent you do not now know who God called and who followed because the blessings followed the one called and the one who was following. Now, but there was problem. The Bible says contention rose against the men of Abraham and the men of Lot. Lot would have said, guys, don't be foolish. You don't know what it took me to get this. You better apologize to these people and maintain these relationships. But Lot was puffed up in pride and Abraham said, we'll be brethren. Let us not fight. He said, look around. Choose where you want. Because I know what is on me, but you choose where you want and go. Anywhere that is left, and Lot, the first decision he made outside of the partnership of Abraham took him to Sodom. That means that prosperity was not a reflection of his wisdom. It was a reflection of his relationship. <laughs> Hallelujah. He went to settle near Sodom. He didn't enter Sodom yet, but he was near Sodom. And Abraham said, okay. And when he left, the Lord now told Abraham, he said, don't worry. From where thou art, lift your eyes. Northwards, it was. Everywhere you have seen. Now, fast forward the passage of time. That guy was in the middle of Sodom already. About to tear his life and destiny. And then God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, you are my friend. Why does God come to a man again? He wants to destroy Sodom and he leaves heaven to come to the earth and looks for one man to say, Abraham, I cannot hide this from you. I'm about to destroy Sodom. And Abraham said, wait, I have an interest there. If there are 50 people, don't go yet. There is somebody who is stubborn and rebellious, but I still love him. I still love him. If there are 10 people, this is a man discussing with God. They are literally negotiating the destinies of men. I'm not teaching you human worship, but it's foolishness to ignore men. To, we live in a world today where in a bit to show, I know that there may be, you know, women of God who have subjugated men and turned it into slavery and made ourselves demigods. That is wrong. But in managing that tragedy, don't throw the baby and the bathwater. You will be making a dangerous mistake. God comes down and meets a man and says, what do you think about it? I'm about to destroy these guys. Do you know what it means for God to call a man your friend? It's like you calling an antelope my friend. I'm meaning it. You are saying, I'm about to build a, play, a house in Takoradi. Um, what do you think? That's what it takes for God to come down. And Abraham said, don't go yet. There is a man. And God sends two angels. Lot is there. There's sodomy. And although he's a righteous man, his wrong decisions have made him to a point he was going to lose his daughters. And these crazy people, when the angels came, they saw them, they wanted to sodomize them. And Lord said, don't bring this embarrassment. Take my daughters. And he said, we don't want the, these, these angels that we want. You can imagine the kind of people. And yet he was still living in the midst of them. He had the power to run away because he did leave that place. So why didn't he leave sins? He remained in Sodom. And the Bible says, when the angel struck them with blindness, brought Lot inside and told him all the news, he sent him out and he was about to leave. That salvation did not just come because of angels alone. A man literally negotiated the salvation of Lot. Do you believe what I'm telling you? There are men who come to church with demons oppressing you. You are singing the praise and worship. You are hearing angels are hearing. The demons are hearing. Yet they do not leave until a man mounts the pulpit. All the spirits Jesus drove in his crusades were there when he arrived. Yet they did not go. The woman who was bound 18 years was there. The spirits behind her were looking at Jesus. He was looking at them and they did not leave. Until he said, woman, thou art loose from your infirmity. Do you believe what I'm teaching you? Men are so powerful that when Jesus resurrected, he gathered the same men, 120 of them, and said, gentlemen, you are the ones who will frontier the course of this vision. Tarry ye until you be endued with power. Why didn't he say, Holy Ghost, go on your own in the earth. Ignore men. Just force people to be saved. No. Do you know that God has always intended to bless you even this year, but he needed a man to say yes? I hope you believe what I'm saying. So when we celebrate men, it is not human worship. 
what we do is we are acknowledging their partnership the pain and the labor in the spirit the sacrifice of alignment that has brought them to a point where indeed they can be called the friend of God hopefully one day when God grants us grace we will we'll examine from scripture what it takes to be a friend of God because to be a friend of God is more than being a believer it's a status in the spirit called a friend of God not many people had that status Please sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Pray in the spirit for one minute. Holy, holy, let's let it see who comes in the name of our God holy holy let's let it see who comes just do what I ask you to do Areka Shalabagados holy holy let's let it see who comes in the name of our God, Hosanna, Hosanna, let's let it see who comes in the name of our God. Ah, one minute pray in the spirit you are receiving as you are praying you are receiving as you are praying divine realities are being imported into your spirit one minute it's part of the conference pray Sana Shabas Kadala Kapraska de Velegata Brande Gevelekos Shevelega de Vegata Branda Gavalakata Braca de Velegata Shabas Sabraska Bereta Kafra de Gavalenda Kaparua Sedesh Paranda Kapraska de Velegate Vega de Velegate Mariata Shabakada Velegate Frenda Geverekos Yata In Jesus matchless name we have prayed in Jesus matchless name we have prayed Amen. ladies and gentlemen hear me this revelation alone if this is all you know if this is the only light that comes it is not sufficient to make you rise to the zenith of your prophetic destiny but it sure will not keep you on the ground Amen. Man of God, do not ignore the man God has given you. Alone you will be defeated. As powerful as Elijah is when he ran away from Jezebel, when God met him, he said, I am alone. God said, no. It's only your pride that has made you believe you are alone. There are 7,000 others who have not bared to bear. There are many great men who do not have economic men to stand with them. Great preacher but broke and poor you cannot do much because God sent men to hold your hands and your pride push them away I don't need you I'm anointed there are men today who God has placed in politics and government in economy are we together in diplomatic circles that in partnership with those men your life becomes invincible upon the earth that if people want to strike you economically, there are men who stand like the men of David to defend you. When people want to come from political angles, there are gatekeepers who said, not at my watch. When people want to strike you using diplomacy, 
to stop your access to the nations there are men can i teach you something do not when you see people excel in life it's not only anointing no they are excelling is a composite of a network of strong men i hope you believe what i'm telling you yes strong men there are men today whose signature can open doors is a master key even if it is on a piece of paper they can tear it and sign and say help as requested we'll talk later and you carry a paper you don't know the implication and someone is about to throw you out of an office so when God says I will favor you he's saying that because there are men in the system already who can partner with you hallelujah do you believe what I'm telling you you don't need too many men in your life but you need a few strategic ones let me list four of them for you very quickly number one you need divine connectors divine connectors are not powerful people they just know who is powerful divine connectors are like the slave girl the slave girl that was with Nam, um, with Naaman. Naaman was a captain of the Syrian army. The Bible says he was a valiant man in war, but that could not cure him of his leprosy. The entire journey that would lead him to Elisha came as a result of the counsel of a young maid who attended to his wife. Divine connectors do not have the form and the fashion to be desired. It takes humility and discernment. Your divine connector can be, as we call it in Nigeria, a bus conductor. Your divine connector can be someone, your cab driver. You order an Uber or a Bolt and someone can be in that car listening to a man of God's message. And your 20 minutes journey can be the beginning of knowing the grace that will help you. Divine connectors are powerful. That is why if you only respect great people, you will be in trouble. Because great people are enhanced and helped by supposedly average people when you see an office looking clean it's not the ceo that cleaned it there was someone who cleaned it and put things in place and that someone who cleaned it can choose to pull away your file and that's the end of it as small as he is he can stop a ceo from getting a contract respect great people but honor small people just for sake of description hallelujah there are people who only respect those who are rich, anointed, and great. Anybody who is your contemporary or below you, you can kick them while you are honoring others. It's hypocrisy. The Bible says, honor all men. And it says, honor the king. So you can see a little baby, can even be your daughter, playing all the time. And one day she'll say, mommy, let's go to church. That was the Holy Ghost speaking. Because something would happen in church that day that would redefine your life. Your gate man. All the time can watch you and you say, how are you, sir? But one day he'll say, sir, this is your sickness. There's a man of God I know. I don't know if you can talk to him. And that can be your connection point. Someone can be passing a flyer randomly and pass the flyer of a seminar that you may just collect, but that can be the answer to your prayer. The key to working with divine connectors is discernment. Always discern. As weak as they may look, Number two, men of influence. The second group of men that you need in your life are men of influence. Men of influence are men of timber and caliber. Through their sacrifices and for most of them, the dignity of kingdom integrity interplaying the laws of the kingdom and the laws of success have arisen to a point of notoriety and influence. Their endorsement, their referral, their recommendation to your life can redefine your possibilities. Hallelujah. The wine presser had a dream. Joseph interpreted it. There was no reward. The baker had a dream. Joseph interpreted it. There was no reward. But when the king had a dream, as soon as Joseph interpreted it, he became prime minister. Three men had dreams. Joseph interpreted three people's dreams. The problem was the status of the dreamers. Ah, when you interpret a king's dream, you don't remain in the prison again. So when God wants to lift you, he will not just send dreamers. He will send kings who are dreamers. He interpreted the dream of the wine presser. He interpreted the dream of the baker. 
but when he stood before the king when the king was done talking he said oh king it's not about cows and it's not about plants it's about the law of season something that will befall the earth it has happened twice to me it is established and he spoke to the king and look at his diplomacy let a king find a man so discreet and wise in other words king i dare you search around if you will find a man like this Are we together when you serve kings you never serve from the prison they have the power to bring you out of the prison the Bible says and the king sent for him and they brought him out of his dungeon there are people who are shouting and praying Lord bless this family take us out of shame and reproach and one man in Ghana who even loves God can sign something for you and that would be it Oh, the door of admission is closed. That is a relative statement. It depends on who is speaking. <laughs> Let me tell you the truth. Law and order at every level and leadership and access and influence at every level is relative. If it takes men to write it, men can change it under certain conditions. Not every condition. You need men of influence, so you do. You do. They are gatekeepers one person can come to you and look at you and endorse you and bring you to a place where you are lifted and elevated now politicians know this even though many of them do it in a very bad way unfortunately but most of them understand the power of relationships you may have heard it in my teaching why will a billionaire or a millionaire travel across kilometers to come and celebrate the birthday of a rich man's two-year-old son is he his mate why did he arrive there i mean come on please a man that told you you've been trying to get in touch with him he's told you I am busy yet you are watching TV and you are finding him and then a television station is recording the birthday with all the adverts waiting online they are recording the birthday of a two-year-old child playing around and pouring drink on the ground and you see very noble men nodding did they really come for the birthday <laughs> I'm not saying to go and run around the corridors of psychophants and people who are godless there is order and we do it with discernment and caution but by all means you better begin to thank God when noble people come into your life even as a pastor don't get into the pride of telling everyone I don't care anybody God brings a noble person one like Joseph of Arimathea and we throw them away and say it does not matter they leave you with your frustration and go they are the ones and you find out that people are praying your answer comes to you and you do not know you know they were praying for Peter to come out of the prison in Acts chapter 12 when Peter came out of the prison and went to where believers were praying, they opened the door and saw him and closed it back. They said, no, it is his angel. This is the guy they were praying about. And yet he had come as an answer. And they closed the door again. They said, let's keep praying. Most believers keep praying, but when their answers come, they come in men and they do not know. The moment you start praying, start discerning the men who are coming. Because answers come embodied in men. Sit down, let's finish up. So number one, divine connectors. Two men of influence. Number three, gifted men. I was watching your media recap of my teaching yesterday and I just whispered to the bishop, I said your media people are nice people. Their production, their, their intelligence for production is good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, as a member of this church, you are happy. But were you the one who did that work? No. But you can share in your glory, in the glory of the, you know, the commendation. Why? Because of the presence of gifted men. Perhaps the men who did this now are nameless, faceless, somewhere doing their work. Gifted people are powerful. The greatest corporations on earth thrive well because they take out time to invest in bringing together the best minds. Gifted people are a blessing. Gifted people are a blessing. When God brings gifted people to your life spiritually, corporately, don't throw them away. Appreciate them. Gifted people are powerful. You don't appreciate your expert driver till you sit to be driven by one who doesn't know what he's doing. And may God help you that you don't know the scriptures that guarantee long life. <laughs> Hallelujah.
One time we're going to fly to where I can't remember and the weather was not good and we needed to get there because um, we couldn't disappoint the people. And so the captain told us, he said, okay, we're going to fly, but for whatever, any reason, just to let you know, if the weather gets too bad and we cannot land, we'll have to reverse back. We said, okay, fine, let's take the risk. And I got in there and that guy was so good. I watched the way he was maneuvering a very bad weather. I had already prepared. One thing I know, I will not die, number one. But then the convenience of bouncing like a ball in the air, it's not a very pleasant experience. Hallelujah. But that guy maneuvered his way. And when we arrived, I had to whisper to him. I said, you are very good. And he just smiled with the confidence of an expert. It's good to know something. Even if you don't know everything, be a master at something. It takes away shame and reproach. It truly does. <laughs> Hallelujah. Refuse to be average. Knowing many things, small, small, small. It's better to know something so good. It will give you a space in the table of the great. Number four, very quickly. The last group of men that you need are called burden bearers. I can spend all day teaching you on this. Burden bearers don't move you forward, but they stop you from going backward. These are men who love you for you. They don't love the gift. No. Their love for you is beyond being emoji, being a musician. They are the ones who will cry with you. They are the ones who will stand with you. They don't live with you. They die with you. Can I tell you, in your whole life, you will not find so many of these people. But I pray that you will find them in your life. Burden bearers are powerful people. When Jesus died, even his disciples, before he would die, his disciples that loved him so much, they ran away, justifiably so. They didn't want to die. They ran away. But there was a woman who came to embalm him, to rub oil on him, remember? Yeah. She came and she found an empty tomb. She said, what is going on? She would take the risk to come and do that. What if she was killed? What if she was arrested? burden bearers they are not ashamed of carrying the scar to stand with you they are not ashamed they will cry with you there are many great people today who have all the three except for the last and when moments in their lives come that demand help down times in their lives they have nobody to stand with them nobody to stand with them they can call you king of kings when it's a triumphant entry only because they ate bread but the same people will look at you and say crucify him you will look at them they will say yes i ate your bread you will still die <laughs> but there are a few others john stood by jesus on the cross mary stood by jesus if we perish let's perish but this one is our own we're standing with him can i tell you when especially for ministry if you've been in ministry for a while no matter how short a while it is, you would have learned the pain of being left alone. That the, as a man of God, if people only love you because you are anointed and because you are a sound preacher, you are sitting on a time bomb. They must love the version of you beyond the pulpit and love you for who you are. There are men today, let me tell you, if they hear that certain people do not have food, they will fly if need be, bend over backwards and say, not at my watch. There are people today, if they pass on to glory, there are others who say their children are my responsibility until they become established. Now, many believers do not know this. Respectfully speaking, now I want to make a statement. Unbelievers, especially Muslims, they understand this even greater than believers. Most believers are not relational. They are only there for gallant days and glorious days. Job was the richest man in the East. He had relatives, he had brethren. They all ran away from him. The only person who stood by him was his precious wife. And even her got tired one day and said, curse God and die. Just die. Let's say a diplomatic way to say, listen, this thing has eaten your body. You've lost it. Just die. It's a noble way. Just die so that at least I can rest. But at least she stood by him. My first prayer every time I teach on men is that you will be this kind of man I just described. That you will be there for people. There are a group of friends called Friends for Food. They are only there when it is time to eat and when it is time to celebrate. 
but I'm praying that you will not be such a person. Say amen. amen. There has to be somebody in your life that you love beyond the glitz and the glamour. People who can count on you. That if anybody leaves me crying, not this brother, not this pastor. There are pastors who have had financial issues and everybody they had helped and built and labored or just waved them goodbye and say, well, I bid you good speed, be warm. May God, who you have always preached about, come and rescue you. And while the man is there with the wife and the children in pain, crying, and in the midst of all that betrayal and confusion, here comes sincere people who will tell you, I am here. I never left. Why do we love the Holy Spirit so much? Because among so many things, he's the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He's called the comforter. Hallelujah. You may have heard it in my teachings. One of my life's goal aside being a preacher is that God will grant me the grace and the heart to be there for people at the moment when nobody else is there. It is a very noble honor to be part of people's tears, to be part of people's pain. That someone can look at you today. You can build a transgenerational blessing for your children and your children's children. Someone will look at you and say, I will, I don't know you. You are a stubborn boy, but your father did something in 1980 that will not make me forget you. That man, when I was crying before I became a permanent secretary or be before I became a man of God, I was hungry and your father kept feeding me every month. I lost my job for three years and your father took 20% of his salary and was giving me every day. And I covenanted that I would look for his children and children's children. And even though I don't like you as a person, but your father's kindness to me, is there any man in the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? There are some of you right now, what you are doing for people, I don't mean to scare you, but it's your children that will suffer it. You are insulting everybody. You are not part of anybody's joy. One of the greatest ways to succeed is to look for people who God is helping and to partner with their rising edge your impact in the history of men let them remember you for what you did yesterday if you were not with me while i was farming let me not see you when i'm harvesting what are you doing there hallelujah the one who comes to join you farming is the one who believes that a harvest is coming this is the reason why i made up my mind that as a man of god younger ministers that god is helping and raising no matter their tantrums and their childishness, I will not throw them away. It's better to make mistakes in our presence. Let's see it and correct them and manage them and help them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because you throw them away based on the law of seasons, whether you like it or not, according to the time of life, one day there will be a decline. And the person who you said will not rise, when he now finally rises, he will rub it on your face and you will spend the remaining part of your life learning a painful lesson. Learn this. It is better to keep quiet than to look at people and tell them you are a failure. You may bite your finger in pain and regret. There are many people today who cannot rise and cannot remain because they pointed fingers at Jesus when they saw him in a manger and said, no, this cannot be Savior. Joseph had a dream. He saw the sun, moon, 11 stars bowing to him. And when he saw that, he told his brothers and the brothers said, you must be stupid, we'll kill you. We are not going to bow to you. Fast forward a few years later, here he comes, the prime minister of Egypt. They did not even know their brother again. And they came to bow. And he looked at them, he said, brothers, come and sit at table. It is the same me. They were afraid because they thought they were going to die. He said, no, you meant it for evil. But if within your evil, there was God's prophecy and God's plan. Hallelujah. You can't be there for everybody, but be there for somebody. Did you hear what I said? You can't be there for everybody. No. I would learn this lesson painfully by looking in a Catholic building and seeing a crucifix there. And it occurred to me for the first time that it was not my face that was there. You can't be there for everybody. Because there are people who can blackmail men of God and say, you were not there for me. No. 
we didn't die for your sins we are witnesses pointing you to the one who died for your sins hallelujah there are people who go around and sleep and then when they wake up they stretch themselves and start ringing your number by 2 a.m 3 a.m and say you promise to be there for us and sometimes you can feel guilty and blackmailed but as a man of god and say, okay let me pick the call no if it's an emergency go to the police station i will help you i love you i will give my best but you're not going to blackmail me emotionally no jesus died you can approach him directly there is a new and living way we are witnesses so I'm not teaching you to just kill yourself. There are people who have run themselves to death. There are people who have gotten into all kinds of pain and problem simply because they want a reputation that is, is that, that a reputation of acceptance by everybody. No, that's not what I'm teaching you. But by all means, please be there for somebody. Be there for somebody. That someone may mean mama at home. That someone may mean your father at home. That someone may mean your brethren, your brothers. That someone may mean, oh, apostle, but do you know I'm a millionaire? Your millions does not count until we can trace how it made someone's life better. <laughs> Hallelujah. My God. Can I give you the last one? Listen, listen, listen. Do you know that all we have been saying was 0.5? Okay, so number six now. Let me, let me leave five. We've done... We've done justice on five. You don't tell me thank you by saying thank you. Become a living epistle of this thing we're teaching. That is the greatest way to tell a man of God thank you. That hopefully by God's grace next year by this time, your life becomes so accelerated. You are so empowered and you can say thank God for the truths that I heard. That is the greatest way to tell a man of God thank you. But you see, most people who jump and shout in church are usually the ones who will not practice one of these kinds of things. Because the energy it takes to listen sometimes, we get very emotional and then we don't listen. And at the end of it, what did you gain? So, wow, it was just a powerful service. I hope you are not like that. Number six. Number six. I like Ghana. Hallelujah. Thank you. By the way, you have to teach me Ghana. You have to teach me. I, I know only two words. I know Akwaba. And then I know Medase. So I'm ready. I'm ready for the next lecture. So somebody, I, I need somebody. Some, you, somebody has got to teach me something. Hallelujah. Okay, number six, number six. Let's get to number six. What is the sixth level of light you must encounter? Maybe I'll just touch on that and then we'll come back in the evening and then we'll do justice. Um, I want to take the time to minister to people tonight. And so we'll be praying, we'll be speaking over your life and we'll be imparting very mighty graces upon our lives tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Right. You must know your adversary, the devil. The sixth level of light and knowledge you need to walk in dominion and to be empowered is that you must know your adversary, the devil. In all your knowledge, if you are ignorant of Satan nor the satanic kingdom, you will not excel. That is the truth. You must know your adversary, the devil. John chapter 10 and verse 10. John 10, 10. The Bible says, the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. A spirit that is characterized by these tripartite disasters is worth your knowledge. That any time you see Satan, you know his signature by stealing, killing, and destruction. Jesus said, I am come that you may have life, and that you may have it more abundantly. Scripture number two. First Peter 5, 8 and 9. Please write these scriptures down. First Peter 5, 8 and 9. First Peter 5, 8 and 9. Be sober, he says. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, including Ghana, seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9. He says, whom resist 
steadfastly in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. He says to resist him. There is an adversary that is determined to thwart God's purpose in your life, your church, your ministry, your business, your family, your career, everything, your assignment and even your destiny. 1 John chapter 2 and 14. 1 John 2.14 1 John 2.14 I have written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because you are strong. Is that 14? Give us 14 please. Not 11, 14. Yes. And I have, okay. And have the word of God abiding in you. Help me read the last statement. And ye have overcome the wicked one. Satan is not called the kind one. He's not called the friendly one. Those attributes are not with Satan. He's called the wicked one. Meaning when he sees a life, a father, a mother, a husband, a wife, when he sees a believer, all he's thinking about is how do I destroy this destiny? Can I give you one more scripture? 2 Corinthians 2.11 2 Corinthians 2.11 2 Corinthians 2.11 2 Lest Satan should get an advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. So Satan always searches for loopholes. Loopholes in your spiritual understanding. Loopholes in your consecration. Loopholes around your life. That if the garrison of knowledge does not protect and preserve you, you can be a victim. And the Bible calls it an advantage unto him. And it says to not give Satan an advantage. That means he can find one. When Satan finds a hole, he will bore it until it becomes a door. There are many believers who are ignorant about Satan. Jesus did not teach that. When Jesus walked upon the earth, in his earth walk, he taught about Satan. He taught about demons. This is different from glorifying Satan and demons. Giving believers spiritual intelligence to understand their adversary is an advantage for their victory. It was Jesus himself who taught that when a spirit leaves a man, it goes through dry regions and not finding a place of safety, it would tell itself, let me return to my house. He's still calling the man his house. And he will gather seven other spirits greater than itself. They call Jesus Beelzebub, that he was casting out demons by the prince of demons. And Jesus said, no, a kingdom divided itself against itself shall not stand. There were many things Jesus taught about Satan. He said, you are of the father, your father, the devil, because he was a murderer from the beginning. We never knew he was a murderer from the beginning. It was Jesus who told us and abided not in the truth. In fact, we never knew Satan was a thief. It was Jesus that taught us that Satan was a thief. And that he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Believers cannot afford to be ignorant as to who Satan is. If you must stand in your victory and establish your victory in Christ, you must understand the satanic kingdom. Paul spoke to us and said, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. It was Paul that helped us to arrange this organogram of the satanic kingdom. When Jesus came to rebuke the spirit of the man in Gadara, the spirit came and he said, we are legion. That was where we learned that a legion of demons that the satanic kingdom even has an organized structure where one spirit can speak on behalf of the others. And they pleaded with Jesus and said, do not cast us out of this city. We have been here a long time. We have built our systems around this city. And Jesus said, go. And they left him and entered into swine. And people lost their businesses because one person was delivered. That one person became an evangelist. No wonder they looked for him to keep him down. They studied the destinies of men before afflicting them. The one you call the madman in Gadara was supposed to be the evangelist in Gadara. That was his destiny. 
So when Satan comes to Takoradi, he does not just look for everybody. There are certain people he wants to find because he knows that when he finds one person, it is equivalent to putting down 1,000 people as victims. Mm. Hallelujah. The teaching of Satan and demons should not end up glorifying Satan nor imparting fear in the saints. If you approach demonology from that standpoint, you're not accurate. So sometimes, um, and, and we preachers sometimes can be victims of this, we end up painting a picture that makes Satan look so invincible. We give such a, 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 an impression of intelligence and you know so many things. At the end of it, it's almost as if you want to be converted to now worship him because you are saying, a hey, man who is this wise and powerful, what am I still doing here? That's not the idea. When you learn about accidents, it is for you to be an excellent driver. Nobody, if you teach people how to drive, among all the teachings, you must teach them. For drivers who become professional, there is a course on accidents. They literally study different kinds of accidents and how to be able to maneuver their ways. Pilots become captains because there are courses about disaster, air disaster management. You are not teaching the pilot because you want him to die. But it is that knowledge that makes him a professional pilot. Are we together now? So, we must approach the subject of demonology, deliverance, and the, the dark kingdom from a standpoint of an overall spiritual orientation that is supposed to empower the saints holistically. Don't just isolate Satan and give him an unusual credence and an unusual, at the end of it, believers are shaking, they are shivering in fear. And then sometimes we find pride that we've created a lot of mysticism and we've imparted fear. That's not Jesus' approach. He taught on Satan, but then they could stand tall in the victory. The Bible says, now thanks be to God, which causes us always to triumph. Are we learning? But then to just throw it away and say, don't tell me about Satan. All I want to know is about Jesus. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's like saying, don't tell me about brakes. I don't need brakes. Not hand brakes, not even the one. Just, just show me how to accelerate. Sooner or later. <sighs> Hallelujah. Ignorance is not good. It is the reason why the house of God is a place of knowledge. Bethel, the place of bread. Where we are given the hallowed bread of the spirit. Man shall not live by bread alone. There is another kind of life that we receive. You live by bread, your natural food. But you live by light, the word of God. Even in your spirit. Hallelujah. Listen to me. Your victory in Christ becomes established. When you truly understand who Satan is and who demons are, and then you know that they are not as indomitable as they propose to be, not in light of what Christ has done, not in light of the systems of advantage and the weapons of victory that have been given to us. It was Paul who took out time to mentor the church in Ephesus. And when he was done teaching them about everything, he now taught them something called the whole armor of God. Is that in your Bible? And he, with the intelligence, the intelligence of an intellectual, he began to paint pictures of a warrior. The breastplate of righteousness, he says. The helmet of salvation. Your feet shod together with the gospel of peace and holding the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith. He says, wherein ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts and haven't done all to stand. He says, stand. Now you are a warrior. You would notice there was no shield for your back because with that kind of armory there is no turning back hallelujah tonight we're going to be experiencing the triumph of light over darkness there are many people who have come for this conference and are coming tonight oppressed coming with all kinds of plagues of darkness this is the knowledge that has empowered us to be able to tell the nations come together. We have something of divine quality to serve you. 
it will be pride to gather people and claim to know God and claim to talk to them and claim he can bless, he can lift, he can heal and deliver. Where is your confidence standing on? This is the light. The knowledge of God. The knowledge of yourself. Let's do a quick recap. Number three. The knowledge of your prophetic place in life and destiny. Elisha knew this so much. He told the king, he said, send Naaman. Let him know that there is a prophet in Israel, not a messenger in Israel. He knew he was a prophet of God in Israel. This was not just an acclamation of status for the sake of ego. That after this conference, we can say there is a businessman in Ghana. There is an apostle in Ghana. There is a prophet in Ghana. There is an evangelist in Ghana. There is a church in Ghana. There are believers in Ghana. There are businessmen. There are politicians in Ghana. There are people of influence because you know, you know. I'm walking in power. I walk in miracles. I live a life of favor. I know who I am. That's what I would let you hear. You need to know who you are in light of who Christ is. Then to know your place in destiny, it gives you security. Your honor is in your assignment. Your prosperity is in your assignment. Your relevance is in your assignment. It is frustrating to teach a fish how to fly. No matter how obedient that fish is, it will be a poor student. Leave it in the water. And you see the inbuilt creativity. There are birds that can come from long distances in the air and come and pick a fish. But they cannot remain in the ocean for a long time. As great as man is, we've learned how to swim. We've learned how to fly. But our place of habitation is the earth. We don't swim forever and we don't fly. <laughs> Excuse me. We don't fly forever. When you find a man flying forever, he will eventually die. He will die of fatigue. When you find a man swimming forever, he will eventually drown. Are we together? We can fly. We can swim. We can move by the sea. But land is the place of our habitation. So don't try to judge a fish by its ability to fly. You'll be making a mistake. You throw the fish up and it helplessly comes down. But the genius and the creativity of that fish is when it is at sea. Hallelujah. Find your place. And then to understand the mysteries of the kingdom, number four. The modus operandi of the kingdom. The fifth kind of light that I've taught you is to understand man as the zenith of God's creation. And then finally, to know your adversary, the devil. And to know the victory that has been given to you against him. He says, behold, I give you power against. Power against against there are several kinds of power the first one we see revealed to the saints in the bible is power to become as many as believed in him he gave them power to become there is power to become that is for your translation and transformation there is power against hallelujah i think we should stop here and pray this is good for the morning rise up on your feet Hold hands with someone by your left and right if you can. I want us to pray together. Hold hands with someone by your left and right. In the next one minute, I want us to pray in the spirit together as a family of faith, holding hands together and you are praying in the spirit and then I'll give you two prayer points and we're done for the morning. Go ahead and pray. You don't need to know the person whose hand you are holding. All you need to know is that he loves Jesus. And he came for this international prophetic gathering to rise, to become great, to excel, to manifest as a witness and as an ambassador. Go ahead and pray. The next one minute, we are praying in the spirit with dedicated focus on Jesus, dedicated focus on your destiny. As you pray, I'd like you to see the new you rising, the anointed you rising, the enlightened you rising, the empowered you rising.
Shabaka Paruska la Barenta Fereketo Sabiash Sasha Balashka Balaka Paratos Shabran de Gebereketos Legra Kata Parakata Fresca de Belenda Pas Sobrosco de Balakata Few more seconds. Pray. Sabalakata shafraska de beleketa. Spirit, I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. By your Spirit, I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. Prayer point number one. You are going to pray and say, Holy Spirit, I yield myself. I yield my faculties. Take me to a dimension of empowerment through light. That where I am, the realm of darkness or limited revelation that has kept me. Jesus said when he the spirit of truth is come he will guide you into all truth now you're going to cry and say Holy Spirit I yield myself take me on a journey in the spirit a journey of enlightenment someone is praying a journey of enlightenment enlightenment through scripture an impartation of the spirit of revelation Take me on a journey, Spirit of the Living God. You're a man of God. Pray that prayer. A journey in the Spirit. Higher realms. Greater dimensions of light. Illumination. Power. That gives stature and stability to my life. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, final prayer point, Father, the next level of my prophetic destiny, let it be opened unto me in this conference. Go ahead and pray. The next level. For some of you, you have come to the end of a season. That's why God brought you here. But you must know the next season you are to step in. No assumptions. No assumptions. No assumptions. No assumptions. Is someone praying? Cry to the Lord. Let it be from the depth of your heart. I sense that many people are coming to an end of a very strange season in their life. You must know when seasons come to an end and you must know when new prophetic horizons have been opened. And of the sons of Issachar, men who had an understanding of the times and they knew what Israel ought to do. The next level of my music ministry, the next level in business, the next level in the church, the ministry, the apostolic and prophetic platform, the prayer group, the next level. Let me not camp around yesterday, whereas the spirit has moved to new heights, new planes in the spirit. 
Job said there is a path which no fowl has seen. The whelps of the lion has not trodden. In Jesus' matchless name we have prayed. In Jesus' matchless name we have prayed. Amen. There are many things that the Lord is going to be doing for us tonight. Number one, he will grant us access to light again. There is something I want to show you this night by the spirit of the living God. And then we are going to trust God for grace to pray. Come tonight prepared to pray. I hope you love to pray. He spake a parable to the end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. We will trust God for grace to build stamina in the spirit as we pray under the corporate anointing. And then we will trust the Holy Spirit to reach down with his might and power and to bring breakthroughs, deliverances. I trust God with you that someone tonight will come here and certain circles certain patterns certain age-long captivities that may have defied your prayer your fasting God has sent us by the privilege of the election of grace with the rod of the higher priesthood to bring an end to some of these oppressions how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth the Bible declares with the Holy Ghost and with power he went about doing good healing all they that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him and then I think the high point of tonight's meeting is the impartation. Please do not miss it. And for those who are following online, you can invite all your friends and your loved ones. Perhaps you are a pastor who may not have had the honor and the opportunity to fly into Ghana. You may be following from any part of the world, Europe, America, Asia, even here in Africa or here in Ghana. You can connect impartation is a powerful mystery I'm going to be showing you tonight is a spiritual system by which men access foreign graces to their lives and with it they are empowered to do more to be relevant even within this prophetic season but for now I declare that the Lord bless you may the hand of the Almighty rest upon you in the name of Jesus that between now and the evening session I pray that God will stir a hunger within your heart that your appetite for spiritual things for accurate knowledge will be so heightened and for many of you even before the evening the evening for you will be a thanksgiving service because you would already have received your testimony in the name of Jesus Christ we pray amen and amen give Jesus a big hand clap